Through the meeting of the Arlington Select Board from Monday, March 22nd, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, the Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Here, thank you. Steve DeCourcy. Here. Len Diggins. Present. And Dan Dunn. Here. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine. Yes. Doug Heim. Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Mars participating remotely. Good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, considered consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which combined posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment even if members of the public do not provide comment. Participants are advised that people may be, be listening but do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. This meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and and develop accurate minutes. It is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus agenda dashboard. But we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We now turn to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps to generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as a chair will afford the public comment opportunities as follows. I will ask the members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be taken by Roll call vote. Takes us to item number two, our consent agenda. We have one item for approval. Blue jean ball lawn signs through April 10th, 2021. Do we have someone from the ACA that wants to present on this? Yes, I see Tom. Yep, there he is. Tom Formicola, I'll bring him right up. Tom, can you hear us? Now, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear, we can hear you Got now. It. Very good, and let me see if you can see me. There I am. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Do you want me to just launch in and give you a little description about what we're yeah. asking? So you can just tell us about the request. Great. Uh, we're doing our Blue Jean Ball fundraiser on April 10th, and we are hoping to put um, uh, lawn signs, 18 by 20 
four inches. There's 24 of them uh, in well-trafficked areas uh, of the town to promote um, awareness of it and in the hope that people will go home and buy tickets for it. Sure. All righty. I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you. Uh, first, I'd move approval. And um, it's a very aggressive lawn sign effort, which is good because people are um, looking for information. These are 24 great spots. And my only question would be, um, I'm just going to assume that you have a plan to uh, gather the lawn signs after the event is finished. So that I you, promise you know, we will. Okay. No, only because you may need at least if not the sign, you can use the six again. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Mr. Dunn. Uh, this is one of those things where I don't think we actually have the authority for what we're being asked to do, but at the same time, I'm going to say yes, because I want to support the event and uh, the cleanup is what matters. But uh, the actual jurisdiction of these particular locations is really tricky, but that doesn't shouldn't slow us down. Uh, so that's all I got. And do you have a second on that one as well? Second, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. Mr. Diggins? Oh, that was an interesting comment, Mr. Dunn. Uh, yeah, uh, um, so I have no comments other than to say April 10th. It's the election day, means, but but thankfully, you know, um, it's going to be remote, means, so you'll get attendance because if it was going to be live, we know that everyone would be at home, riveted to ACMI, watching the results. So you'd have to have a monitor up there spinning out the results, me. So so um, good luck, me. I went last year was a good time, me, and I hope um, it's, it's, you do well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I, I support the motion. I really like the sign, the way you're, you've incorporated the blue jean in, into the uh, into the signage there. So best of luck uh, on, on April 10th, and uh, hopefully next year we can uh, have the ball back at uh, Town Hall. Yep, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. And the blue jean ball is always something we look forward to every year, and it's one of the, one of the premier events that we have at Town Hall. So I'm looking forward to supporting it this year, and I'm much more looking forward to attending it next year. Me too. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion for approval, second by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Hyde. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to traffic rules and order and other business. One item, review and approve outdoor performance regulations. So I think Mr. Chapdelaine is going to take this one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the draft policy that has been put before the board tonight, uh, when we put it on the agenda last week, we thought we were going to be prepared to ask for approval, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, still wanted to very briefly talk about it. Um, what, what you have before you is the product of a lot of work by members of the Economic Development Recovery Task Force, the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, the Chamber of Commerce, and town staff, uh, really in recognition of the arts and culture community and sector being one of those most hard hit economically by the impacts of the pandemic, and our desire to really, as soon as it is safe and practical, uh, allow for arts and culture to, to, to try to get back, um, get, get its footing back in the community in a safe manner. So um, you, you can see the framework we're thinking about uh, in the draft policy that's before the board tonight. Um, what we need to do before we ask for your approval is just go through a few more paces with the Board of Health and the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, to make sure that we all have a common understanding of things. And I think most importantly, make sure that with what, we're, what we eventually ask you to approve in this policy, is the way that we consistently approach events and programming on public spaces from a, from a public health point of view over the course of the next few months. So we'll iron out those um, those details hopefully in the next week, maybe two weeks by the time that uh, the board next meets and hopefully bring it back before you for approval then. All right, any questions or comments from the board, Mr. DeCourcy? Uh, yeah, first of all, I'll move receipt of the, of the draft and I appreciate the Additional time. I know we had received uh, some questions in, through our emails today from from Mr. Klein, and I know there are some issues that, as the town manager 
indicated just need to be worked out for consistency. So I have no questions. I just want to move receipt. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I second the motion. I'm definitely supportive of the intent here, and I look forward to getting it done. Yep. Mrs. Mahan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. No questions. I support the motion. Yep. Mr. Diggins? I support the motion, too, and I certainly appreciate the questions from Mr. Klein. I look forward to seeing how this is all handled. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be handled well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, and I definitely support the the policy. Um, this is something that the Economic Recovery Task Force has been discussed a number of times, and something that certainly the business owners are looking forward to. And I think we can do and we can do well. And I talked to Ms. Chaplain a little while ago, briefly, and just to reassure anyone that's watching that was tuned into the meeting for this particular purpose that. We are going to move on this. We're not going to drag our feet. We want to make sure that this is in place for the warmer weather that we are now experiencing. So we will uh, we'll work to get this on the next agenda. All right. We have a motion to receive. Attorney Han. This is Mahan. Yes. Thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Hope. Thank you. All right, that takes us to warrant article hearings. Articles for review. We have article 11, 14, 19, 20, article 24, which was tabled from our last meeting, and our article 26. So the first up is article 11, bylaw amendment, storm water management. Ms. Chaplain, do we have someone is it from DPW speaking on this? or? I believe Mr. Town Council was going to um, okay. address this. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. And a quick note before I start on that. I want to note that I, I'm sorry, unfortunately, due to some changing schedules and things that we were trying to get put on um, the agenda for this meeting, uh, I didn't prepare a memo for you on Article 14. And I'm very lucky that uh, Steve Michalka from the Historic District Commission prepared such a thorough mo memo, uh, including a draft motion uh, with respect to the fiberglass gutter issue. Um, so I'm grateful to Steve for uh, excellent work done. I'm sorry that uh, in the shortest shuffle of Warren articles that we're putting on, I didn't uh, put that one on. Um, this article, Article 11, with respect to stormwater management, returns to the select board from uh, last year's discussion. You, you may recall, uh, for those who were on the board at that time, that you moved positive action on this update to the stormwater management bylaw, which really provides um, five core changes. Um, it looks a little bit more comprehensive in the draft uh, that you got from uh, Emily Sullivan, the environmental planner, who worked in conjunction with uh, the town engineering, engineering department uh, to bring uh, this updated bylaw uh, before you. So number one, uh, I think as it puts in my, my, my memo, it provides a little bit of a clearer goal uh, for stormwater management um, that cites the statutory basis for the authority for us to uh, engage in the type of stormwater management that we do. Uh, second, it improves and updates some definitions that, were, that are a little bit outdated in the current version. Uh, third, and this is probably what applies to most uh, sort of homeowners who might have some concerns about what, what this is and isn't, it clarifies the applicability uh, of the bylaw within different con types of projects so that, you know, if you're, uh, you know, repaving, you know, a sidewalk, not a sidewalk, a walkway up to your front door from the sidewalk, um, it makes it a little clear that, that most projects like that don't, uh, don't get a stormwater management review. But if you're, you know, doing some sort of substantial regrading and repaving uh, for the purposes of you know, improving a driveway or adding parking spots, something like that, uh, it might be, uh, you're probably gonna get some kind of stormwater management review. Uh, fourth, it uh, uh, allows for promulgation of more detailed rules and regulations consistent with the bylaw. This is one of those areas somewhat similar to some other things that the board's tackled in the last couple of years that it's very hard uh, to detail every single specific element of a functional bylaw within the bylaw itself, because sometimes things get updated or they get changed um, 
both from the perspective of what the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection would expect with respect to some of the, uh, the technical aspects of this type of work. So it allows um, uh, for regulations to be promulgated consistent with the bylaw. And then finally, uh, this is a, obviously a, a, a big deal. It ensures compatibility with EPA permitting. Um, the, some of the few tweaks between last year's version, which you had previously approved, and had we not had a truncated town meeting, would have gone in front of you, uh, is it uh, added a little bit of language that made it uh, clear that, um, uh, that this was compliant with MS4 permits required by the EPA um, and made some of the definitions more consistent with the Conservation Commission's existing regulations. Uh, so uh, with that, I think, you know, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them as best I can. Um, we had tried to schedule this a couple of different times uh, when the environmental planner could be here, but um, realistically speaking, I think our Warren article schedule is, is, is so busy that it's been hard to do that. So I, I'm definitely prepared to, to talk about it and answer some, some basic questions and talking points. Um, and I hope that I can provide you sufficient information to make a decision on this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, um, it, this is, it, um, I mean, there's a lot here. It, uh, and <laughs> it almost seems like it would be the sort of thing that goes to um, ARB or, or ZBA, but it's definitely in our wheelhouse. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that uh, it is something that uh, is crafted in a way that it can handle um, changes that may um, arise through other legislation. So. Um, I am going to um, move positive action on this. So, and I have no further, excuse me, I have no further comment. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will second that. And I have three questions or perhaps one that are three parts. Um, and this is sort of a reach by taking advantage of the opportunity that this talks to um, storm water management on public and private uh, property uh, in accordance with Mass DEP. So my questions are um, for the DCR owned land, uh, either to um, Attorney Heim or Ms. Sullivan, on the DCR property <clears throat> along the Alwife, is that covered in this uh, bylaw? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Mahan, for the question. So uh, I think they're, they're slightly uh, uh, different things in the sense that what this bylaw does is uh, it sort of has, uh, a, a, if you will, a triggering event. Um, I know what you're referencing. We've been concerned for a long time about uh, discharge into the airwife uh, rook, but um, the, 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 this, Bylaw updating this bylaw doesn't change the thrust threshold for projects requiring a permit. It's still project driven. So there certainly are circumstances if there's a project over at Alewife where this might be might be triggered. The the testing uh, with respect to stormwater, I think that you're referencing, still is ongoing, and there are requirements that I know that we're continue to try to um, uh, sort of tighten, but but. Uh, for better or for worse, this update isn't necessarily related to um, stormwater discharges that aren't essentially um, being evaluated in the context of a, of a, of a project to uh, revise or construct something new. Uh, thank you, Attorney Hahn. I guess as a follow-up, and I'm reaching here, I totally understand. Um, but in terms of, um, which is coming up in the next two, three years, the NIPTES uh, variance waiver process in the city of Somerville and in Cambridge um, and the CSO discharges, which goes to storm water. Is this something we should or could apply? I'm hoping the answer is like, I know I'm reaching, but um, my thing is if we're gonna hold the town of Arlington to, to a certain standard, um, can we, if we can't do DCR right now, um, if we can do when the NIPTES um, variance waiver process comes up, 
hold the cities of Somerville and Cambridge to the same standards that we're holding up the town of Arlington to. Yeah, that's so. so uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Mahan. I think that that's a really important point. I think what Mrs. Mahan is referencing, just for other members of the board of public, is that Arlington is a, a really a model uh, stormwater um, uh, management uh, community, and obviously, stormwater is not just a entirely local issue. Uh, there, we have water bodies that are are fed uh, by our neighbors as well. I think that the um, while this doesn't directly address that, um, I think it, the MS4 permit uh, is going to hold everybody to some higher standards, and that will be a benefit. This is part of our way of keeping up with those higher the, the higher standards, but hopefully, it will also drag other communities that might be seeking waivers from certain types of discharge um, up as well. Um, I, I'll have to, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, answer totally conclusively as to whether or not um, there's a way in which this might tie into some other, you know, communities or, D, or, or DCR if there's not an active project context. I'm not trying to punt Mrs. Mahan. I just, I don't see it right now, but I, I, I don't, want to totally rule out that by improving our own stormwater management that we won't have sort of further leverage points when we're saying look you know we're doing our part with respect to these water bodies we need um you know these state and uh, other neighboring municipalities to step it up so I, I think it is helpful in that regard but i'm not sure that there's something under this this uh, schema that would that would give us you know some more direct control over that. Okay, and I guess I would ask um, Town Council and Ms. Sullivan, maybe not comment tonight, but um, we we're talking about holding Arlington to a certain standard that we hold um, the cities of Somerville and Cambridge with their CSO, which is combined sewer overflows, which means when some water goes real high, they get to dump all their gaga or whatever poop or whatever you want to call it um, into our waterways. I'm, I, I know I'm breaching, but um, if we could just kind of keep that on the radar that we were holding Allen to a high standard, if we could use this um, uh, bylaw amendment for stormwater management um, with uh, the cities of Somerville and Cambridge with the remaining three CSO discharges into the alewife on the Arlington side, especially when the NIPTES permits come, comes up for, for review, which is shortly, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pond. I'll make sure to uh, talk to uh, the environmental planner and the engineering department about it further. Mr. Corsi? Uh, no questions. Mr. Dunn? No questions. Thank you. And I will support this again. This is a public hearing. If anyone wishes to speak on Article 11, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application now. Going once, going twice. All right, with that, we have a motion for positive action by Ms. Dagan, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. And if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, the Environmental Planner put together a terrific memo on this for any members of the public that are interested in learning a little bit more about Arlington's commitment uh, to this, uh, from everything from climate resiliency to um, uh, 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 more basic stormwater management. Um, so I'll stop talking. Uh, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, just uh, for, for consideration, uh, including that memo and an appendix in the selectman's report, if appropriate. Yep, absolutely. Uh, that brings us to Article 14, Bylaw Amendment Gutters in Historic Districts. And I see Mr. Mikalka with us. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. We can just say your name for the record. Just tell us a little about, about the article. 
Sure. Steve McAlka, chair of the Arlington Historic Districts Commission. I uh, live on Russell Street in Precinct 9. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the select board this evening. Uh, I apologize ahead of time if I say board of selectmen. I keep falling back into that habit. It's a hard one to break. Um, so I did provide a memo that I think lays out the um, uh, just the, the rationale for why we're asking for this bylaw change. But just to summarize very quickly, the, if you don't know, the historic district commissions have jurisdiction over changes to visible features um, within the historic districts. One of these features are um, gutters, obviously important features on houses. Um, we have a preference for retaining historic materials, replacing like with like, and in fact, we don't have to do a formal review of like with like. Those kinds of repairs and changes and replacements can be done without a formal notice hearing, um, formal notice process, or a formal hearing. However, any changes that change the visual look, change materials, those types of things, unless there's a specific exemption in the bylaw, have to go through the full hearing process. What we found over the past 10 years is the um, materials avail available now to replace gutters. When people do replace wood gutters with wood gutters, they fail very quickly. You just don't have the old growth wood that you had available. Um, I still have some wood gutters in my house that were installed in 1872. Um, you're not gonna find anything that's going to last like that anymore. Uh, what we found is those gutters were failing very quickly and that um, you know compromised the historic structures. It was just uh, an unsustainable situation. Uh, we spent a number of years looking for alternatives, other things that would meet the goals of historic accuracy, um, as well as the goals of preserving the structures. Um, and we kind of lucked out around 2008 with, um, if you remember the economic crisis there, people stopped building boats. People that were building boats said, hey, what else can I do with this technology? And they actually adapted the boat building process to building fiberglass gutters. They took old wood gutters, created forms, and then created the fiberglass um, gutter within that form. So it actually has the texture and exact dimensions of historic gutters. Um, and when installed on um, uh, houses really are indistinguishable from the wood gutters because of um, the profiles. And they also have the added advantage of having more capacity. And obviously they have the longevity that you don't get from the wood today. So what we found is um, since um, these materials have become available and there are now multiple manufacturers in the marketplace um, that make these products um, is that uh, uh, we've seen a increasing number of applications asking for this um, on structures in the historic districts. And I think for the past four or five years, we've approved every single application that's become before us. It's almost pro forma at this point. We do ask for some specifics around installation and making sure they're using the right materials and people who know what they're doing. Um, but those are really, a, you know, a few process um, things. Then um, we spend literally minutes at hearings on these things, but we still have to, because of the way the bylaws written, go through the formal notice process, make people wait for our next hearing, go through the hearing process. It's just um, unnecessary for the commission. It's unnecessary for the homeowners. And we like to move these kinds of changes into a category that's exempt under the bylaws so that we can go ahead and issue certificates of what are called non-applicability without formal notice or formal hearing. And we provided the language and exactly how it how that would work. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, and thank you for the presentation. All right, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I'll move favorable action. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Makaka, for the detailed memo and and for the explanation tonight. And um, just a question: to to obtain the certificate of non applicability, is it is it not? We just lost you, Steve. My I'm process. sorry, I lost you. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Um, is that any better? Or yep. Okay, I it, just a question on um, the process to uh, to obtain a certificate of non applicability. Is it an application that's required, or just a letter to to obtain that now? It, it is an application. On our application, there's a box for a certificate of appropriateness or non-applicability. If you check off non-applicability, you just have to provide enough information so that we understand the scope of the project and make sure it meets within the guide or falls within the guidelines um, or the bylaw change. 
um, and then we would issue the certificate. We don't have to do any formal notice or have a hearing. You know, if there's a question, then I will um, typically follow up with the applicant, clarify the application and issue the certificate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I broke out before I made the motion for favorable action, but I'll, I'll move that. And, and again, thank you to Mr. McCauker for the detailed memo. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, second, uh, no questions. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, no questions. Thank you, Mr. Dickens. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to support it. Just a quick question. You can give me a very quick answer. Uh, is um, the are these gutters I mean in, in general environmentally friendly? I mean, or is a combination of the way that they're produced uh, by and combined with uh, how often or how seldom they need to be replaced a net positive environmentally? Uh, I haven't done a study of that. I can't point to anything specifically, but I know I do know that these gutters are going to be very long lived and not require multiple repairs. So I think you're um, you, you're eliminating some um, se sequential um, pulling things off the house and throwing them into a landfill and replacing with something else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Very detailed and your memo as well. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public want to speak to this article, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application. Seeing none, we have a motion for a favorable action that has been seconded. Attorney Heim. This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. That takes us to Article 19. Vote establishment of town committee on auto and property insurance claims and losses. Do we have Mr. Fisher with us? Mr. Fisher, can you hear us? Say your name and tell us a little bit about the article. So you have to unmute yourself there. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. Um, did I hear correctly that this should be limited to three minutes? Your presentation, we yeah. said five to seven minutes. Okay, I think, I'm, I think I'm below four minutes. Uh, thank you for your time considering this proposal. I asked the board to support Article 19 to see if the town meeting will vote to learn the costs of our auto and homeowner insurance premiums and claims and to establish a committee charged with that mission. Last year, the select board asked me what actions could such a study lead to. I'd like to respond to that question after explaining the reasons behind this proposal. Arlington needs new sources of revenue to prevent overrides, as everyone knows. At the same time, we know a few facts about incidents and causes of our insurance losses. For example, how many houses had termite damage last year? Can we know how many car crashes actually happened associated with texting, DWI, what are their costs? And how many houses had problems caused by solar panels and so on? At the same time, insurance costs appear incredibly high when considered as the cost of the town as a whole or by precinct. Precinct 6, for example, has about 1,300 cars whose total premiums amounts to about $1.3 million, according to data from the Insurance Information Institute. How can we not be curious about such a large figure? The total cash flow for all of our insurance, homeowner and auto, might be in the range of $60 million. We don't know. I'm not suggesting this study only to lower our premiums. Rather, I think we should find out the answer to this question. If we consolidate our insurance process as much as possible, could the savings be adequate to provide some of the funding for the town prevention services, such as police and fire? I think further savings would accrue because of, with a unified model of insurance, clear knowledge of claims and their causes would enable targeted prevention programs, such as termites. These are my motivations, a new source of town revenue and a more informed community. 
Here are some possible actions that could follow from this study. We might learn that the current system is extremely economical and claims are in line with the cost of premiums. We probably will have enri enriched our understanding about local insurance and it might lead to recommendations as to how to improve the existing systems. I doubt it will have been a waste of time. Let's, if we find that the cost of claims is small compared to the cost of premiums, and if the idea garners broad support, follow-up actions could be that a subcommittee could work up a report on existing self-insured programs, such as the single-payer auto insurance programs of British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. What are the strengths and weaknesses of these systems? That subcommittee could also look at the way the state of Massachusetts self-insures its state-owned fleet. How does this work and what are the problems? We might find specific recurring home insurance claims that ought to be addressed and recommend action. Also, if the data is clear and if the idea, and again, if the idea garners wide support, the committee could ask this Mass Municipal Association to look at this idea. We could also collaborate with other interested committees. I think this project can only increase our knowledge of the town and I ask for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll turn to the board, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Fisher for bringing it forward again. Um, so I, have you, are there any um, programs out there that you think that the town should be replicating like other towns that have adopted specific programs? Not in Massachusetts for auto or property insurance. Um, the closest that comes to mind is that uh, Arlington itself and most towns and cities do the same dynamic uh, for for their workers comp on a frighteningly small scale with no reinsurance. Um, and the dynamics of it based on my interviews with uh, Ed Marlinga and John Marr years ago are the same. The, and I interviewed um, employees who were very protective of the town and motivated. Uh, you, you can ask Ed Marlinga about it. Um, it's interesting. It's it's kind of too good to be true. They said that people get dimes dropped on them if they cheat and Ed studies patterns of loss. They, they implement prevention programs. Um, they had just done a, such a prevention program for uh, trips and falls. And also they had just done a prevention pr program because they had so many costs due to back injuries because that's when the, uh, the workforce was really aging because this was years ago. And, and that, but to be clear, that's for the town's insurance is not like the town's insurance, not the residents of the town. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So um, I think I'm pretty sure that I recommended a, a vote of no action last year and yeah. uh, I, I'm still in the same place. I just don't see a direct enough path forward about what this uh, study committee could come up with and suggest. Uh, I think that there are a lot of avenues out there for interested people to, per, to pursue in, uh, understanding more about the insurance industry in Massachusetts, including uh, the division of insurance with the Massachusetts and through our state reg rep uh, regulation, excuse me, our state representation. And uh, I, I just don't think that it's a, a fruitful path for the town to engage in a study without act like, are there are other studies that I'm supportive of where I understand what the end goal might or might not be. And this one, I just still can't understand it. Um, so uh, I'm, I would like to move that we recommend no action. All right, Mr. Mahan. Did, did you say me? Cause I didn't hear the word. Yep. Okay. Um, I will second Mr. Dunn's motion um, just around the fact that um, everything that my colleague Mr. Dunn stated as well as I don't really see in this Warren article a thing to establish a town committee. Um, and I understand the comments 
that the opponent received from Mr. Malinger and Mr. Maher, who are both retired and have moved on and no longer with us, I, I don't have any sense of what that committee would be. So I, I would second Mr. Dunn's motion. Mr. DeCorsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I support Mr. Dunn's motion. Thank you for bringing this forward, Mr. Fisher. We, we did speak about this last year and, and I, um, I, I, I tend to agree with the, Mr. Dunn's comments on this as well. Mr. Diggins? I'm intrigued. I mean, um, because we, we, I understand where everyone's coming from. Sometimes you just don't know um, what can come out of something until you take a look at it. And, and I appreciate Mr. Fisher's in honesty in, uh, about the, the uncertainty about what could come out of this as opposed to in trying to promise us the moon and the stars being as a result of the study. I mean, uh, so, so, some questions. So, I mean, how would the committee be, what would the committee be composed? How would it be composed? I would propose a, a precinct based committee with any interested, any interested uh, precinct, someone would come forward and be a precinct captain, ideally one of, uh, one of the town meeting members. Um, I'd like to say, Everyone I talk with about this, which in much more detail is actually wildly enthusiastic about the idea. Um, I omitted a sentence, uh, which was the eventual outcome would be a statewide network of community-based plans with a third party administrator working in partnership with each town. So it would be statewide. And I admit this is far-fetched and incredibly far reaching but uh, British Columbia is about the same size with 3.7 million cars. And you asked for a, an example of this kind of program in Massachusetts. Um, if you go on the webpage for Insurance Corporation of British Columbia, it's incredible. It acts as a, as a community function. They do a lot of funding of uh, local prevention activities. Um, I can't say enough about the many examples that it does. This might take a few years, uh, but part of the reason I don't just do it is that if there was an actual sanction approval of town meeting, I could say this has quantifiable interests, 120 people or however many people voted in favor in town meeting. And then it's less odd because honestly, it's odd to ask people these kind of questions. Um, I've been over the years, I've been involved with perhaps 10 insurance claims uh, for homeowners insurance. And you, you get a good feel for how it works, what's good, what's not. And, um, you know, I see, I see termite damage over and over and nothing is done. The reason is, it's actually excluded. It's not covered. And this, this is not an insurance system that's invested in the town's welfare. Um, and once you, once you get inside of this, the, the, the question of socialism just disappears. That it just like, is, this, is the current system for the best? Is it really so efficient? Or are we just conditioned to accept it? So I don't wanna to take too much more of your time, but. Yeah. I just, I just have a, a, a couple more questions. So how would you go about getting the information that you're trying to get? With a survey, I would ask people, um, I, I have done this for about 30 people. Um, it, it, I, I would, I would in initially do a lit drop in each interested uh, precinct. It takes about three or four hours to do that and invite people to respond. Um, by email or by taking a photograph of the of it and then uh, jump to survey monkey on that basis um, and gather as much information as possible. So it wouldn't draw on the town's resources in order to go about trying to get this information? No. And, and so you feel that the imprimatur of town meeting would make people more likely to respond to the survey? Hmm. Yes, and and also, Vision Twenty Twenty would feel enabled to to help. Um, I was a representative 
um, town meeting representative to Vision 2020 from about 1998 to uh, 2015 when Julie Brazil took over. And uh, at one point we asked people to name their insurance companies for us. And we put none of your business. Um, 3000 responses produced the names of, seven, of 70, literally 70 insurance companies serving the town. And our, our main impression was that it's just so fragmented and that's, that's the issue. Um, but that my point is that that was felt to be radical. I, I, I asked uh, later, I asked um, Vision 2020 to just empower me to say to my precinct, this is a town, this is a Vision 2020 uh, project. And their their response after much debate was it's they didn't they didn't want they didn't want me to say that. And it's because it just seems so odd and and far fetched. Um, that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. It, um, well, look, I mean, I, I, I think we can see how this is going to go. Uh, 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 and, and so uh, I, I, I would say don't be discouraged. I mean, um, be, let's see, let's continue working on it. I mean, um, and and, and um, let's try to, first off, you try and do some work on your own um, and make some headway. And then second, I mean, um, trying try this again um and one quick um side question you didn't happen to submit a study to the upwp or the mpo did you a what study no what is okay. that no no problem no problem if you don't know what it is you didn't all right thank you okay and thank you um you know i sort of, i think this is so much of the comments last year is that it's an a for effort and i think you're trying to you really are trying to help residents but I just don't think that, you know, the, the stated goal is succinct enough at this time, as Mr. Dunn said. So, okay. With that. Thanks for your time. Yep. You still have some public commentary potentially. Uh, all right. With that, this is a public hearing. If anybody wishes to speak on this article, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application. And there's no public commentary. So we have a motion for a no action, which has been seconded. Attorney Heim. Uh, sorry. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. The curious in me is just too, too curious to say yes, so I have to say no. Uh, Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's a 4 1 vote. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. All right, that takes us to Article 20 on our agenda. We vote for public remote participation. Do we have Ms. Dre with us? Hi, good evening. Um, can the slideshow that I that I um, submitted, is it possible to use that? Yep, I you have that? Give you, yeah, I will give you, do, do you have it? Um, or would you like me to bring sure. it up on the screen? I'm happy to pull it up if you want, if that's okay. easiest. Let me, see if I, let me see if I can access, give me one second. I would, I, I, yeah. So we can just make the share function if you have Great. it. Yeah, I, it's it's in a different yeah. orientation when I open it up, so I, I can let you share. Perfect, thank you. Okay, should you should be able to share now? Okay, share screen. All right, how we doing? All right, we Sharon? Yeah, we, we can see it. Perfect, great, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so 
Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street, thank you very much. I'm really excited to present this article to you. Um, one silver lining of COVID has been the ability to remotely attend and participate in a wide variety of town meetings. And these lowered barriers have, I've seen increased resident participation and increased equity and increased, increased the diversity of voices that are being seen and heard and listened to in town government. And this incredible response offers Arlington the opportunity to now intentionally choose to maintain expanded access and equitable spaces in ways that maximize equity and diversity. Many barriers to access just disappeared with uh, remote participation. It didn't matter anymore what the weather was, what the bus schedule was, there was too many stairs to climb. I couldn't find a babysitter, I had a long day at work or just wanna sit on the couch or maybe I'm still at work. This hybrid meetings allows us to instantly be there wherever we are at that moment, whoever we are at that moment. And of course, my favorite part is the very quick commute home to bed. <laughs> um, I wanna frame this article by offering an analogy of absentee and mail-in voting. So those two options don't change the reality and the rules of how we vote in person. What they do is offer additional ways to vote. And that has an increased accessibility and therefore increases the number of people who vote. And so I believe that hybrid meetings, and, and we've seen this this year, um, will do the same. So it doesn't change the rules of when the public participates during the meeting. It just gives them additional ways to participate. And that, for, therefore, the public participation will remain accessible as it is now, and civic engagement will remain high as it is now. Um, so, oops, I guess I don't really know how to move my, oh, there you go. Okay, so, you know, this is the intention of the article. It's, it's fairly straightforward. And again, it's enhancing the how that people can participate publicly without changing the when of people participating. Um, what this article does is provides the consistent um, policy within the town that will, will relate to all public bodies and it lowers the barriers to access, allows more vibrant and diverse input and does this all in a way that is consistent with open meeting law and the town manager act and respective of the legal requirements regarding, regarding the business of each public body. What it doesn't do is violate open meeting law regulations. As Mr. Heim has stated in his comments, um, there are no set forth requirements for public participation. It, um, there's a lot about the members of the body, like you guys, but there's not much about, there's nothing about how the public can participate remotely. So there's nothing that says you what you have to do or what you can't do, but it does say that you have the option of doing it if you decide to do that. Um, so when I was talking to people, a lot of people wanted to know what did the committees think? What, what, what were their feelings? What was their experiences? So I created a very informal, unscientific six question survey asking them these questions. I mailed it out to 47 of the town's committees, um, asked these questions. And as of today, today I got my 22nd public response. And thank you, Chairman Hurd, for filling it out for the select board. Um, and what we saw was overwhelmingly positive feedback and 40% of the groups reported increased public participation and they all saw it as positive. And not a single person thought that it should not continue after um, the, the pandemic. Um, these are the groups that were, oops, most, uh, most people thought, and this is, would be affected um, and it's no surprise, right? You know people with young children. I mean, this reflects my experience. Um, when my kids were young, I didn't have the time to, I, I had a lot of things to say and I didn't, and I, I had a lot I wanted to learn, but I didn't have four hours to go sit in a meeting and wait for that time for my three minutes to speak. But now people can do that while they're taking care of an elderly parent or they're on their way home from work or they're feeding the kids. It just has opened access. Um, 
The biggest concern, not surprisingly, is about technology, uh, how running it smoothly, how to incorporate people. And, you know, I think that's 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 a legitimate concern that I'm hoping the town can help with. Um, these are I got a lot of really positive uh, comments thinking that you know this was a great idea. And um, I would like to just sort of close by saying that this middle one um, is really what we should focus on, right? This would ensure my attendance. I have a physical ability, disability that sometimes makes it very difficult for me to travel distances. And so I present this also to Arlington as a, a moral decision to make about how do we message who is welcome and whose voices are important. Um, I say we, we throw the windows wide open, right? Like we throw our arms open and we say to everybody, we want to hear from you. You know, the, the residents who are maybe now just paying attention and able to, to attend meetings, those are your future volunteers. Those are your future town meeting members and your, your chairs and your select board, right? If we don't We'll never get to looking different at this level, at the high level, if we don't start to lower the barriers and invite more people at the entry level. And that is what this will continue um, to make possible. Um, these are some groups that endorse, have endorsed this particular endorsement. I thought I was in Ward Article 21, so apologize for that. Um, and I just wanted to also talk, say that we are, would not be alone that the city of Boston is looking to do a similar thing. And there's actually um, an act uh, in front of the state legislation that, that they're talking about that's been co-sponsored by our own senator and representatives, uh, which I appreciate. So we would not be alone doing this. And uh, I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Mr. For the, uh, in so, Steve, we are losing you a little bit. Put into this. Sorry, I... no, I can't hear you. All right, Steve, I'm going to come, come back to you, okay? Um, we'll go to Mr. Dunn, and then we'll, we'll go back to the yeah. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dre. I, def um, I definitely support what your what the article's after in principle. I, I, def I, I absolutely agree in, as you say, opening the, the doors and the windows and, and letting, uh, and not letting, um, enabling as many people in as possible. Um, I do have some questions about like the practical things about this. So like, you know, we hit this point in uh, the, we, we hit this point in the process and what the select board's got to do is got to take a broad warrant article and render it down into a specific motion and say, hey, town meeting, this is the specific motion that you should put forward. And um, I'm, into, in a, in a, I've got a few things in my head that I consider um, obstacles, not blockers, but things that need to be figured out. So, uh, for instance, the technology question is a real one. You know, you've been in our select board room, and you know, like if you think about somebody who's uh, in it coming in remotely to uh, to speak at, at, the, at that like that, like that you, not only does the members of the select board need to hear and the people at the front table, but all the audience needs to hear. And so getting that level of sound projection that works, that doesn't get feedback uh, and, and people and everyone can see it is a, it's a non-trivial technology uh, so, solution there. And then I think about, um, there are some committees that meet in, uh, I select for a school committee, probably more ready for stuff like that. You know, tree committee, finance committee, uh, cemetery trustees, their the, like their meeting locations are not going to be as as conducive for this, um, and so I guess I, I'm wondering if you'd had any, if did you have specific? Uh, so or let me let me wander for just a second more, which is uh, so one possibility here is to say uh, is to is to refer this to a committee and say, all right, committee, figure this out. How what's the practical way to do this? Um, and you know, there's definitely a saying, you know, referring it to the committee is the way to kill it. I'll tell you that isn't my intent right now. My my intent is to try to figure out a way to get to yes, 
and I just uh, don't know how to get to yes um, in the time between now and town meeting. So if you have thoughts about how to get to yes between now and town meeting, I'm listening. Fantastic. So I did submit um, my presentation to the Finance Committee. I'm not sure if you had a chance to see it, but in it, um, I looked at those, I, I looked at the cost and I looked at the logistics. Um, and I went back a year and, you know, we averaged five, meet, five meetings a night, maximum seven. So I looked at where are we currently meeting? Where are the, the, the highest um, areas that we're using for meeting space and identified eight of them. So if we took seven of them, right, that's the maximum that we would need on the extreme. And we outfitted seven meeting spaces with the technology needed, then that would be that would be the how, right? And um, starting from scratch, you know, because I I didn't don't know what the town already has in these different locations, internet, Wi-Fi, you know, um, and I'm not including the select board chambers or the school committee, right? So those are even also perhaps usable. I just don't know what the logistics of who gets to use those. So I didn't want to make assumptions, but it would cost to outfit um, a room, to out outfit fully equipped seven meeting rooms with the, um, the screen that you're going to need and the microphone and the, the speakers um, and everything else, the camera would be, um, $7,490 to fully equip seven meeting spaces. Um, so that's assuming we start from zero. So uh, there are logistics to work out, but I don't, I really don't think that those logistics are a big enough obstacle. Um, I spoke to, um, when I spoke in front of the finance committee, uh, we left it that they were going to talk to the IT department and Mr. Pooler to see whether or not those costs could be absorbed in the current budget or whether there would need to appropriate some money for it. And they ha don't have an, a, an answer as, as of this evening. Um, but you know, when I spoke to people, I spoke to people who did the technology for the schools and how putting them, you know, getting them up and running remotely. And I, um, people did not think the technology was the real obstacle. They thought logistics were the real obstacle. Um, but I think that we can solve the logistics. It will, it, will it be bumpy initially? Yeah. So I guess, um, do you have a sense that, so like the, and maybe this is. Yeah, and you just muted yourself. So, um, the perils of using the space bar. Um, so the, it says uh, established parameters. And so did you have a, like, were you looking for, the, us to put forward a motion that says committees are required, uh, committees are recommended, um, make it easier such that if you do it, this is how you do it. What did you have? Did you have a direction you wanted us to go in? Yes. So also in the in that fine uh, the FinCom presentation, I have um, eight sort of parameters I've already sort of written out, but it it would be to it would be a requirement of public bodies, and that is why. Um, that is why I'm asking for it to come um, from above, right? Be, not make it optional, and but but for the town to support it by saying the these are this is the policy, and we're going to help you get there. Thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm still listening. Yep, Mrs. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that better? Yes, it is. Okay, good. All right. Sorry about that earlier. Um, yeah, I, I'm still getting a. a bad message here. So I'll, I'll try to continue and, and hopefully it, uh, it, it gets better. Um, so as I was saying at the beginning, thank you for the presentation. Um, and, and I do have a question. Maybe we could just talk about for the select board, Mr. A, in terms of what you'd like to see if we go back to the chamber. Is it, is it allowing public part citizens uh, or public forum remotely public hearings remotely or what, what what do you envision assume we could do it so this this is a very very narrowly only applies to uh public participation so however it is that the select board meeting would have their public participation it would offer that in both in person and people to zoom in and do their three minutes of open forum or speak in support of a warrant the rest of that would be if 
the rest of whether or not you as a board want people to be in front of you is up to is remains up to you. This is only affects related to how the public participates when they're allowed to participate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So I and and I see Mr. Dunn's concern in terms of how this gets framed in in terms of a particular motion. Speaking for myself, I mean, at some point we're going to go back into the chamber, and if we can do it, I I would support having remote participation on citizens' open forum or, or public participation. There may have to be time limits that we implement on that, but I mean, I could I could see doing that, and and there may be situations where members aren't comfortable coming back, but the area that I'm concerned about is, it seems to me that this has got to be a committee by committee determination because the open meeting law allows the chair of each committee to determine one, whether there is public participation and two, what the extent of it is. So I think administratively from, from the select board, and I'm curious to see what my colleagues think, I could see looking into doing something like that. And I, and I think it's it's been effective to date. I, I, am a little troubled by how that will work for other committees and what our ability is to tell other committees what they need to do and, and whether they even have, a lot of committees don't even have a public participation component and the open meeting law actually leaves it to the discretion of the chair of each committee to do that. So there is a concern that way, but at least speaking for what we can control, I, I certainly would be open in, in, into looking into that and, and uh, trying to implement that. If, if I could respond to that, the um, open meeting law is very specific uh, about that the, it's at the discretion of the chair it, when people, right, how the public uh, speaks and when the public speaks, but it doesn't speak to how the, the public speaks. So the chair would still be in charge. It's still at the discretion. If they don't allow speaking, then speaking is not allowed. If they only allow it at this way, that's still the when. This is just the how. This is another how, another um, a way to do it. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to move no action on this for um, several reasons. First of all, um, the article is written that it, it's uh, going to be remote participation by members of public in meetings of all public bodies. It does not talk specifically about uh, citizen open forum at select board meetings. It talks about our at least 113 committees and subcommittees that we have in town. Um, and as Ms. Dre has pointed out, that's at the purview of the chairperson in terms of uh, how that uh, is conducted. Uh, I think once we get back to the point, which we're not there yet in terms of, um, we can have meetings where uh, it is open to the public that um, when it comes to it, and it seems to me from Ms. Dre, she's focused around the select board, uh, citizen re resident uh, open forum, uh, the, the other concern I have is I, I don't think this is going to pass the attorney. I guess I would pose this, and I'm sorry, Attorney Hine, um, in terms of the uh, Attorney General's office uh, scrutiny oversight that they have on this. I don't see them ruling this as something that we could do. And if Attorney Han could speak to that, or if he could say, I can't speak to that. Attorney Hine. Um. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it would depend on what the parameters are. So, uh, and Mr. A and I have uh, exchanged correspondence about this. As she noted, she has, I think, eight sort of parameters. One, that it applies to all public bodies. Two, that recordings are made and they're made immediately, or not immediately, but they're made available without request. Three, that people can see and hear each other both live and remotely. Four, that there's an opportunity to actively participate in public comment opportunities uh, remotely. Although there is a note about discretion being afforded to the chairs, um, Then there's a piece about uh, meeting locations and 
discretion about what sort of business is put on there. So I'm not trying to give a, a, a difficult answer, Mrs. Mahan. I think it would just depend a lot on the on the contents. So I think you could have a town bylaw that says there will be, it, it, to the extent that you have public comment, you'll provide opportunities for remote uh, participation in that public comment. Um, but I don't know that you could make that mandatory for all public bodies to have that. Although it's not clear to me that, that Ms. Dre is suggesting that it would be mandatory to have public comment. Does that, does that make sense? No, no. It, it, what, what I have from you, what Ms. Dre is talking about and what she's proposing, the way I interpret it, two different things. She's talking about the select board citizen open forum and then her warrant article talks about uh, remote participation by members of the public, of all public bodies, of all their agenda items here in the town of Arlington. To so me, I that's two vast different things. And and from what I got that you you sent to us was that um, taking into account the uh, Americans with Disability Act, which is a whole nother issue around this that uh, this per perhaps would not survive the scrutiny of the Attorney General. So, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, may I? Yep. So uh, you cannot, in my opinion, require board members uh, on bodies to uh, participate remotely or change the parameters of the open meeting law, I believe that would be uh, rejected um, absent special legislation, I think, which I highlighted. So uh, there are very clear rules with respect to remote participation <clears throat> by members of body. And that's what I'm referring to in the sort of first section of that memo. Um, the second section of the menu memo, I think, we're mostly on the same page that you can have the, the, the open meeting law doesn't speak about the requirements for public participation. You don't have to have any public participation under the open meeting law, remote or otherwise. Um, so it doesn't doesn't speak to that. There are issues with respect to public hearings. Um, and what I mean by public hearings are legal hearings, such as a zoning board of appeals hearing. I'm not sure you could require a, uh, uh, a body like the Zoning Board of Appeals to have remote uh, testimony offered um, under 40A and have that count towards a quote unquote hearing. Um, the piece about the ADA is I just want to make it clear that offering remote participation doesn't necessarily address uh, disability access. Um, for some people, it, it, it certainly may, but it doesn't alleviate us from the requirement to comply with the ADA and, for example, provide ADA accessible physical hearing rooms. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm, what I'm saying is that there are, there are some things under what's a pretty broad warrant article that could be done, and there are some things that, that can't be done, in my opinion. So I, I want to differentiate you can't make a public body, like members of a select board, for example, participate remotely. And if you do participate remotely, everyone has to be able to see and hear the remotely participating uh, member, which may create some of the logistical problems that have been referenced previously. So people in person and online have to see and hear the person who is participating remotely, who's a member. With respect to um, members of the public and the public comment period of a re the resident open forum or some other non-legal hearing type situation, um, I think a board can provide for uh, remote participation um, and that you could have a bylaw 
that says, you know, these are the parameters for, for, for participation. I think your question and Mr. DeCourcy's question are somewhat about, can you make the, you know, Envision Arlington Reservoir Committee, you know, only operate with public comment if they have remote participation, um, or are you divesting the chair of some of that? Um, that that's a pretty close question. Um, I don't have a lot of confidence on the answer to that um, one way or the other, if you can sort of totally uh, preempt a, a chair's decision about uh, how to have public participation. I, I think that to my understanding, Ms. Stray is proposing that you don't, she would leave it up to the chairs to decide whether they're going to have public participation of any kind but if they're going to have it, they have to have it uh, remotely. Okay, I, I guess I would respectfully disagree uh, in this, the fact that Ms. Stray's Warren article is to establish parameters for remote participation uh, by members of the public in the meetings of all public bodies in the town of Arlington. Doesn't say the select board citizen resident open forum. It's saying our 113 plus committees, boards, commissions, authority um, to have remote participation. Um, it doesn't say subject to the chair. It says right. that they have to do it. Uh, I, I don't think this will survive attorney general scrutiny. And um, I understand what Ms. Dray is saying. She's focusing on select board citizen resident participation um, and she's shaking her head no. So I'll disagree with her no shaking head. Um, that, you know, I think in terms of what we've gone through with COVID, um, pre-COVID, the select board meetings were um, available live streamed as well as through ACMI, uh, as well as residents um, were allowed. And I understand we have a Lexington resident that spoke sent some correspondence on this, um, but I, I really weigh on Arlington residents um, that um, we had opportunities for that. We, we get emails, we get uh, phone calls. Um, I certainly think that um, if this Warren article was written that it somehow took into account um, allowing those who truly could not make a meeting. I understand what Mr. A said about you know, being a mother and having kids. Um, I, I, I was in the same boat in terms of, you know, having kids and um, serving the town as well as having a, a extreme special needs young child. Um, but I still was able to um, participate in the town. And that, that's something that you kind of make a, a choice about. Uh, if you can't make it to a meeting, then you can certainly email or, or call a member of the select board or the school committee or the housing authority or the parks and rec commission or the conservation commission or um, the other 112 different committees and commissions. I think this is just um, from what the proponent has suggested, which is she's sort of targeting the select board um, citizen resident participation, but it's going to apply to all 113 um, actually, I think it's more than that. Um, public bodies in the town of Arlington, I, I, I would renew my motion for no action. Thank you. Ms. Diggins? Sorry about that. Sometimes I can't see the line on the microphone very well. Um, uh, so as a courtesy, I'm going to second it. You know, it's no indication of how I'm going to vote. Uh, all I can say, well, what I'll start with saying is, 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 um, I think we know that this is going to come before town meeting in one form or another. We, so, uh, we as select board, we should really, uh, craft our response we, to a town meeting that is going to deal with this. We, uh, and so, um, we, as for me, me, what I very much want is remote access. To everything, he and 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 I me. Mean, whether there's participation or not, it's nice to be able to bounce around 
meetings I mean at will I mean, and, and so um, I don't know what's going to happen with open meeting laws I mean I think that's a big thing to factor in I mean uh, one thing I was hoping to have done by now is to talk to um, our state reps and, and senator and others about this I've just been a little busy uh, to get around to doing that but I think I should really put some effort into doing that sooner rather than later uh, uh, in order to get some understanding as to how things are going and what influence we can have on how things um, turn out with respect to that legislation uh, regardless I think we can work with town staff uh, to uh, try to provide uh, more more access. I mean, as a person who's done TV and, uh, and these remote, I mean, these hybrids, I can tell you, I think the hybrid model is the hardest model. I and mean, uh, I think the full on remote model is probably the one that will work best. And as odd as it may seem, I mean, it may be better to have people in a room I mean, who want to gather in a room I mean, with their laptops on Zoom sessions I mean, uh, so that everyone's on Zoom. You can be talking with someone next to you, I mean, uh, uh, but you're still on Zoom and people are interacting, seeing you on Zoom and, and, and anyone who wants to remotely participate will do so on Zoom. If they can't, if they have to come to uh, the place, I mean, then, then there will be a laptop for them there. My point is that I, mean, I would like to work with town staff I mean, to see what we can do. Uh, uh, regardless of what happens to me with this article, uh, and and um, I don't really know I me mean, to what extent I mean the article can force anyone's hand on this. You know, but like I said, it's going to town meeting. You know, and let's however we decide here, let's make sure that we have a good response uh, or a good good statement so that town meeting really has an understanding of where we're coming from and where we would like to see things go. That's it, thank you. And so I'll just say, so I filled up the question on behalf of myself, not the board as a whole, but you know, in I think the questions were right on point in that we have enjoyed a bit better participation and more public input from more diverse commentators as a result of the remote participation. And I definitely think, like, I'm not the technology guy, but I think that's something that we should continue. And what I envision, which I think is the intent of the article is that it would just, so I, if we're in our old chamber and we have our meetings as we normally do, and we're talking face-to-face -face and we have proponents on for a common VIX license who come in just like they normally do, we go to citizens open forum just like normal we open up the list to anybody that's in the in the chamber and then once that's done we have some sort of a zoom link that's just available and people are sitting in a queue for to speak they have three minutes just like they do here and you know when we're sitting in our meetings we do have ipads in front of us and i'm not again i'm not the technology guy but i assume there's some way to link the two um link the 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 feed from the zoom to acmi which could be broadcast in the chamber you know i have sat there with my sons while they do their remote learning so i understand feedback so i that would be something that we'd have to address but i i do feel like it's something that we can definitely achieve the thing that is a little concerning to me about the requirement for all meetings is that as mr Corsi said that most committees just don't have public participate designated public participation and where in situations where you know I'm on a Ted and we just have agenda items and we speak there's no there's no open forum and what this requirement would take away is at the end sometimes back in the day when we used to sit over at the Bose real estate office sometimes people would come and the same thing happens sometimes with with, with the new Zoom meetings and we say to them, oh, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us why you're here. Tell us, tell us a little bit why you want to come see the meeting. So it, it takes away the option, I guess, for a chair to open up to public participation unexpectedly. I think this certain, I think if we can hone it in the scope of the article to say, you know, we want to have remote participation um, in, really if we can talk about the different boards that 
this would apply to, I think it's, it's a lot more effective, whereas it's not over encompassing. And again, if we can bring the language of the article to in that allows the discretion, and certainly I think we'd want to see some discretion that if it became technologically unfeasible, that we wouldn't have to move forward. But I mean, I think that's where I am. And I'll just invite the town manager in to see if he has any comments since a lot of this is within his jurisdiction. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I would offer a few things. Um, one being that I, I, I probably speak to my colleagues in other communities more regularly during the pandemic than I would have prior just based on Zoom and, and uh, the, the needs to communicate. And I, I would say, um, it's pretty much 100% across the board that local governments agree that we need to find a way to provide remote access um, or hybrid remote access in the next normal uh, because of the increased participation that we've seen and because we've, we've seen and heard from new voices uh, and new people. Um, and and we've, we've widened the table, right? We've, we've, been, we've had this opportunity to provide more seats at the table. So it, it's something I've been giving a lot of thought to talking about with staff internally about how how we would do it. So I, I and I think that seems to line up with the thoughts of both the article proponent and the board tonight that this is um, a very worthy concept and something we need to work on. Um, I'd offer that uh, the town of Franklin actually has been doing hybrid remote meetings since last August. They have a town council form of government. Um, so it's a town that's actually operates like a city type thing, but um, they have some counselors in the chamber, some at, uh, some remote, uh, some people who have agenda items come into the chamber and then all public commenters are remote. Um, I talked to the town manager last week. He said it works very well, but they basically had to build a TV studio in their chambers. Uh, so it is logistically and technologically quite complex. I'm, like to try to find an afternoon to drive down and see it myself and learn a little bit more about how how it works. Um, and then I think, and I hope these comments can be helpful. I think what worries me um, about a mandate before a plan and a mandate before potential state action amending and making the state open meeting law more flexible is that um, we, you know, we'd be putting something in place that might need to soon be tweaked. I, I think perhaps consideration of an endorsement of the development of a hybrid remote access plan for Arlington government meetings um, would provide both the time and flexibility to put, some, put something together that works um, and then can be endorsed by, by the, the select board and other bodies. So I, and I, I offer that and, and hoping uh, and trying to help the board um, and potentially Ms. Dre um, Come to some type of common common agreement on how we can how we can achieve something that I think is probably a common goal. That is a public hearing. We'll turn to the public. Do you, Mr. Hurt, I'm sorry. Yes. May I just interject something? Yep. I just have a quick question because I, I I realize that there may be a source of confusion with respect to uh, where different folks are. So, then if I may just put this question to you for Ms. Dre. There's a recommended vote, which is about an appropriation, um, which would not, which isn't something that the article contemplates. Maybe that's what Ms. Mahan is referencing, but then there's a sort of action item list um, further on the parameters of the Warren article. And I'm, I'll confess, I'm a little confused as to which is the proposal. The recommended vote is an appropriation for a sum of money um, but the action items that sort of one through eight it is more consistent with sort of trying to establish a town bylaw. And, and maybe that's some of the source of uh, confusion on my part uh, with respect to what's sort of in play and what's not. I don't want to interrupt public comment. I'm sorry. I, yeah. May I respond? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, yes, that. Uh, <laughs> That was a part of my not knowing what I was doing, but also thinking that I had to ask the FinCom for money when I went in front of them. So I would ask you to refer back to the initial general public remote participation warrant that was submitted with the general language 
uh, and not that one uh, about appropriating money, um, if I may. And I would also like to mention that I've spoken to the Attorney General's office about whether or not this would violate uh, open meeting law. And they um, were not sure, right? So they, you know, to be honest, because this was new, um, they said that they, when, when something comes in front of them, they look to see, does it violate the, the state law? And so there's nothing, you know, she could, the, the attorney couldn't say yay or nay, but that she would have to wait to see if it came in front of her and then do that kind of research. So um, wanted to put that out there. And I also wanted to um, say that um, I, I'm not against a, an idea of studying this to get it done, right? Um, and giving and making that time to figure out how to do it correctly. I, I'm hesitant to give a lot of time because we have opened the door. We have we have made our we've made ourselves we've made town government accessible, and you have um, brought people to the table that you will then be sort of shutting out and and messaging to them that to wait a little longer that they're not that important yet, and I that's uncomfortable to me. Um, and I would like to say that the only reason um, you know I'm really pleased that Ms. Mahan was able to come to meetings when she had young children. And I think that's really commendable, but that isn't everybody's experience. Um, and that I was simply referring to the select board open forum because that's what Mr. DeCourcy asked me about as to how it would work in the select board. But this is in general to make all of the meetings accessible to people. Thank you. All right, Attorney Heim, does that answer the question? I, mean, I think it answers my question in the sense that I think we're talking about the, the board is is looking at you know what we how we should examine the issue um, and, and I think that what's being proposed is is is, is the town bylaw of, of, of some kind that sort of fits in those premises. So thank you, Mr. Hurd. I appreciate your indulging me. Right. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could, um, before you go to public comment, um, just uh, two comments. Um, we really need a figure which was not provided to FinCom or us about how this would impact 113 plus town public agencies, committees, commissions, authorities, and what that cost would be, especially since we're looking at um, in, in uh, 2023, which we may be able to push out to 2024, an $18 million override. So any five or six figure cost, which I definitely see this in the five figure, um, you know, you, you can't just put proposals before us and say, you know, vote for this and we'll figure out how much it costs. No, you need to put the proposal before us, say how much it costs, how it affects the 113 to 130 um, different, uh, town of Arlington public entities and and what that cost would be um and uh, I, I guess in a most less critique way in terms of Ms. Dre thanking me for being able to attend meetings um I have you know in the house that I live I have three severely handicapped disabled family members and I still was able to attend meetings so um I certainly understand the limits of that. So um, I, I kind of felt like you would give me um, disingenuous platitudes. So uh, I, I'm still not in favor of uh, this Warren article because we don't know what it's saying. We don't know how it's gonna be implemented across all the 130 different um, town city commission agencies. Um, and in light of the fact that this town is going to be facing an override that we will be able to maybe push out one more year in terms of the Recovery Act monies that we receive from the federal government through President Biden, but it's gonna be really tight. So um, I don't think we can take people coming in saying, I think we should do this and let's figure out how much it costs and we'll figure out that later. No, I think proposals should be, this is my proposal, this is what it affects, and this is how much it will cost. And this proposal isn't anywhere near that. 
And thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, let's go to public comment. Uh, so we have a number of hands raised. The first one that I see is Rebecca Gruber. All right, Ms. Group, if you just say your name for the record and keep your comments to under three minutes. Yes, uh, Rebecca Gruber, uh, Pleasant Street. So I'm uh, speaking to encourage you to support this Warren article. Um, this has been a very difficult year. And if there have been any silver linings, one of them has been some of the pivots and adjustments we've made um, in the way we conduct business. Um, one of these adjustments has been the executive order allowing for remote resident participation in our town meetings. This change has resulted in a significant increase in public participation. Um, as you may have noticed, I've been participating um, and I had not previously. Um, my perception is this has allowed for significantly more involvement, transparency, knowledge, and support by the public in the work that you all are doing in the decision-making of our town's governance. Uh, participating remotely has allowed residents who previously would have had great difficulty to attend meetings of boards and committees and commissions. It's removed barriers for seniors, uh, parents with childcare responsibilities, people with disabilities, residents who don't have transportation, caretakers, and it allows these people to be a part of the civic activities of our town. And these are voices Arlington needs to hear from to be the diverse, equitable community we're striving to be. As the day approaches, hopefully quickly, that we can return to normal, let's commit to a new normal and who has a voice in our town's governance. While many of us will be able to once again attend meetings in person, Without remote participation, others in our community will be silenced. Let's do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for everyone who wants to be heard, to speak, and to be engaged in our town. Thank you. You're muted, Mr. Hurd. There it is. That's my, my first of many times that I'll do that. All right, Mr. Helmuth. Hi, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Eric Helmuth on Grandview Road. Um, so I'd, I'd like to encourage the board to find a way to some kind of positive action on this. And I think that, you know, it's clear from the discussion that the scope of this is up for grabs. It's not clear um, exactly, you know, how it could work technologically or le legally in some places. Um, but I really appreciate the intent behind it. And I think everybody here does. Um, and it, it, I, when Mr. Dunn mentioned that, you know, sending things to a committee doesn't always kill that. I, I can tell you from personal experience, uh, when it came to implementing electronic voting in town meeting, that sending things to a committee was exactly the right thing to do because uh, we, were, we were able to really take the time to get the answers that we needed and come back. And, you know, the delay is the delay, um, but we were able to do it right. And I'm not suggesting that that's the best course. You know, maybe there is a hybrid way to refer a full rollout of this or a wider rollout to some, some real study. I think that would be wise. Um, but maybe there's a way to look at, to prioritize and to take immediate action for the highest priority opportunities to preserve some of this ability for the public to participate remotely sooner than that. And you know, I'm not unaware of the TV studio uh, implications of this. Um, but, but which is to say, you know, I would encourage the board to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if there's a way um, to do some of this and to, to do more work later to figure out how it can be expanded, I think that there are, it is an opportunity for equity um, and inclusion in a way that, that's really positive. Uh, I would also offer a practical bit of caution. This comes from my service and experience on the Information Technology Advisory Committee, and I don't speak for them, I speak for myself. But one thing that, that I learned to do is to look for the hidden costs. And I think that when you're studying this, whether that's for full rollout or for, uh, for short, shorter term, um, I would 
caution you to not just look at buying the technology, but to think about the human resources that are gonna be required to train, um, what your expectations would be for committee staff. Are they bringing their own device? Is the town gonna to provide a device? Um, and especially to what extent you require um, live support uh, during the community operation, because you know that that's a scaling issue. But that comes with so over time or or human resource time. If you if there needs to be a help desk that's supporting the inevitable problems that come up, or maybe that can be addressed by policy. If the policy says you know if internet goes out, you know tough luck. We tried our best. I don't know. That's for you to worry about. But I think when we think about the cost, I think buying the equipment is just the first and the easiest step. So that's just a bit of, of, of how I would you know, approach this in my world of, of technology management. But again, you know, if there's a way to move this forward in the spirit of inclusion, uh, I would personally urge the board to, to find a way to take those steps. Thank you. Thank you. Carl Wagner. Hi, uh, can you hear me and see me okay? I'm Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road. Uh, thank you for having my comments. I uh, am very impressed to see that Ms. Ray has brought this before you, and I hope that you will act in the, sorry, there's a cat on my side. I hope it doesn't come in the picture. Uh, I hope that you will uh, act to work with her to craft this so that the big picture of what she's proposing is allowed, which is, we learned how to do Zoom over this 12 month period, and we cannot lose Zoom when we go back to uh, in office meetings with the public. I particularly am reminded of two Arlington board type meetings. One is the AA. At some point, one of the members of the AHA said, where did all these people come from? Because they started having Zoom meetings and the public could finally attend. Well, the answer is those people who attended were the AHA residents and people who care about things there, but they couldn't attend due to various problems or requirements uh, when there were uh, meetings only in person. So the other thing was um, the ARB had a member on it, which actually said is that people go to these meetings and they stop processes of, 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 of progress. Well, if that's really true, that book, by the way, was called Neighborhood Defenders. If it's really true, the way to make things better is to let the public not only go if they're available and they're free to go, but let them chime in via internet. Uh, lastly, uh, when I was a town meeting member and came to you to reduce the time speaking in town meeting, you wisely worked with me to make a compromise that worked for everybody. And I hope, therefore, you will send Miss Dre away with a promise to work with her to come up with something that it sounds like you all broadly agree with. Uh, and it might be a substitute motion that Ms. Dre brings back to you. But please do not send it to the waste bin because you don't want to look like you're on the wrong side of history when this is all over. Thank you very much. All right, Paul Schlickman. Thank you and uh, good evening. I I'm intrigued by the idea. I just want to point out that one of the big problems with doing something like this is the school committee room as it now exists will be slated for demolition within the next 12 months and we're gonna be camping in temporary space wherever it is. I mean, I was also intrigued by listening to the town manager talk about what kind of a studio they have in Franklin. So that when we build a new school committee room, we can build it so that technologically we'll be able to do this. But I would hope that just speaking as a resident and a town meeting member, not speaking for the school committee, that uh, whatever happens to this article, it, it happens with the realization that it's going to be very difficult for the school committee uh, over the next couple of years until we are in our new quarters. Thank you. Mustafa Baroglu. Sorry, I tried to demote Mr. Schlickman and I demoted Mr. Uh, Baraglu uh, unintentionally, excuse me. Ready to go. 
Let's try that again. That's what you get for demoting me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got to come up with some. Yeah. Better Here we go. Okay. Um, I should have actually spoken up for um, Andrew Fisher's article. I grew up in Vancouver. We had BCIT. Um, Vancouver's behind me in this picture. Um, so. Um, Say your name for the record. Oh, sorry. Mustafa Vargli, 26 Shawnee Road. For, for what it's worth, town meeting member, precinct 10. Um, so I'm, I'm here to speak in um, um, support of uh, Elizabeth Gray's um, proposed warrant article. I, I understand that some of the language needs to be resolved or um, tightened up in terms of making it um, into, I guess, an article that we can vote on and have an action at the end of. Um, but I think I would echo, don't make you know perfect enemy of the good. Um, we should um, get this to, to go forward. I've certainly been able to listen in and comment on meetings. I wouldn't have taken the time um, to attend for 15 minutes or 30 minutes where it actually mattered um, out of a three hour block. Um, but when I'm at home, I can do other things. Um, as an example, tonight I'm helping my mom um, out with her taxes online. Um, so um, I, you know, I, I, I probably wouldn't have come in for, what is it now, nine o'clock? I wouldn't have been in here for the last hour and a half to hour and 45 minutes for this five minutes of speaking opportunity. Um, I think um, there's a couple of things that I, I'd say that came up in the discussion. First of all, I, I think uh, Ms. Mahan mentioned 113 committees. I think Elizabeth mentioned that they tend to happen in seven to eight places. Um, it's, I, and maybe it's more. Um, I think you can prioritize these rooms. You can start working from the top down. Um, I'm not sure why Ms. Mahan is shaking her head, but um, um, just keep going. Okay. Um, so, um, so I think you know if if there are 113 meeting rooms, I think that's something that should be streamlined in the town, frankly, because I don't want to find 113 places as a resident to go and visit. Um, I'd like to be able to, you know, go to the main places and go see people do what they're doing. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have an override coming, that's true. If you wanna build support for an override, having people come and understand what the town does would be really valuable. Giving people a voice in what's gonna be used for their override would be really valuable. Cutting people out of the town after they've been shown what's available I think is going to taste really bad at the end of all this. And I think that it's, um, I think say it's a $50,000 buy, it's going to be at the beginning, mostly equipment. And then it's going to be some support that will hopefully get better and more efficient. And I think it's probably the best 50,000 you can spend to convince people that this town is going to give them the services and the things that they want for the money that they're going to give the town. Um, so I, I think that um, it, you know, in all cases in this situation, more information would be a better thing. Um, I can say that I think I started working in industry in 2000. Every company I have been in has had hybrid meetings. We have had consultants all over the world. We have had consultants all over the country. Um, the technology has improved vastly since 2000. I remember what the guy said in before 2005 for video conferencing, the expectation is sky high and the technology wasn't there. Now we have FaceTime, we have Zoom, we have, um, um, I do, you know, Google Duo. I mean, we use WhatsApp. We're all fluent with this type of technology. It'll be in three minutes if you can just wrap up your sure. stuff. All right. So to make it short and sweet, just put an iPad in every room, connect it so everybody else can broadcast their voices out to everybody else and put a screen up to bring the other ones in. Start there and then make it better from that. Thank you. And I do support the article. I think you should vote for it. Okay, we have Anna Hankin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I'm Anna Hankin, Marion Road. I would also like to speak in support of this article. Um, I have been able to attend these meetings um, only because they're on Zoom, um, both because I'm a graduate student and typically at this time I would either still be in the laboratory or commuting home. Um, and because right now I actually have two herniated discs and it's really actually super painful for me to be sitting and talking to you right now. That's why I have a pillow 
here all the time. I'm usually laying down during most of these meetings. Um, and I've spoken to other people in the disabled community in Arlington who have said that they've had a lot of difficulty getting to meetings. They have difficulty sitting in those meetings and being able to call from home makes it so that they can participate in Arlington governance. Otherwise, it's just not an option. I know that there were difficulties with people in wheelchairs accessing the select board chambers. That's a major issue. You guys need to have the voices of the disabled people of Arlington at meetings. Um, it's important to hear from us. Um, and this does require work and it does require resources, but the people whose voices are being brought in, they matter. They really do. All of us matter. And the work you do is very important. Um, and in terms of getting advice on how to implement this, one of the resources you guys have that I don't think you realize you have is teachers, the public school teachers have been working with hybrid models all year, and they actually probably have a lot of really useful recommendations for you guys and how to implement this, what kind of problems you're going to run into, what is the biggest pain point, and how to have people participate without it getting out of hand, especially because they've got to control kids all day. Um, hopefully, the adults of Arlington are a little less rowdy than kids. Um, so I really hope you guys find some way to move forward with this because it is so important for everyone to participate, um, especially those who would otherwise really struggle to get to these meetings, um, especially because parking around town hall is really quite difficult. I don't know if I would be able to find a way to get to these meetings, even if I was able to leave work on time. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weinstein? Are you with us? Yes. Hi. You just muted yourself. Yep, there you go. Still muted. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, letting me speak for a moment. Um, first of all, I, w I just want to say how um, encouraged I am by the support that the select board uh, in large part has given, uh, if not the the letter of the article, at least the uh, the intent of it, um, and that there seems to be um, rel relatively widespread support for some sort of continuation of what essentially, I think what the article is attempting to do is simply continue what we're doing currently tonight during the select board um, when the select board begins to meet in person. Uh, I know that there have been, you know, different uh, uh, interpretations of what the intent was, but I think that that really is the intent, is simply to allow, when we go back to in-person meeting, to maintain some kind of uh, ability for people who currently are able to attend remotely to be able to continue. And I think that uh, Ms. Dre did her due diligence in going to the Finance Committee uh, and speaking with a whole bunch of other people that uh, the evaluation that there would only have to be around seven meeting rooms uh, that the town set up and uh, equipped for doing this, and the cost seems very reasonable. Um, and uh, as uh, Mr. Mustafa had pointed out, why should we have 130 different places uh, for people to have to look uh, to uh, uh, in order to attend a meeting in person when they could be done within uh, you know, a handful of, of meeting rooms? Um, I, I think uh, the other point I just wanted to make was that um, I think Mr. Diggins actually uh, stated very clearly how it could be done very easily. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, I, I, it was very understandable that you could have in your meeting, you could simply bring your laptop or your iPad uh, and continue what you're doing now in a room where people could also attend, uh, granted that there would be some uh, public address uh, necessitations there. But I, I just uh, uh, would also like to echo that it would be, uh, really a, a wonderful thing if the select board could come up with some some way to 
incorporate this concept and move forward with it without um, dismissing it uh, because the, uh, there are some concerns that it would be too difficult to achieve. Uh, and the technology today uh, makes it uh, much more achievable. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, you're muted. Sorry. All right, Darcy. Okay. All right. Ms. Downey, can you hear us? Yeah, there we go. Um, I can't see me. Oh, I see. It's one of those, is it? All right. So, um, this has been a very interesting discussion about it. And a lot of the things that people have talked about, I already thought about this. Elizabeth came to me uh, a while ago um, because I'm the chair of the Disability Commission now. Um, and I think if this was a non-binding resolution, you'd all go, yay, and that would be that. I do think that there are some real problems with doing this and some real advantages. The huge advantage, absolutely right. You're getting voices you've never heard before. You're getting a lot better participation. If you look at what happened at virtual town meeting, that is a, a, a bona fide case for doing this. They had, I believe, the best attendance they've ever had, in essence, on a regular basis. And that was very important. And that's the kind of thing you would hope would happen at most meetings. On the other hand, <laughs> I've heard a couple of things people say here and I wanna go, mm, no. Uh, for example, as someone who's now chairing these meetings, I have been thinking about this, but the idea that I'm gonna be able to, it's hard enough to do a Zoom meeting with the limited number of people I have. It's really hard to do it if it's hybrid. I know there are ways to do it. I think every town you know, in America that can possibly do it will be working on it, but it's not a, a snap your fingers and it's done. It's not a spend $10,000 and it's done because among other things, you, know, you have a bunch of volunteers running it. And just like the town meeting members, the level of technological expertise, the level of comfortableness with tech at, frankly, the whole digital divide. I mean, some of those voices that you're hearing from, you're hearing because they have the ability, you know, they have a good internet connection. I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody who has a bad one on a Zoom thing. So all of a sudden, they're not getting their voice heard, even though if they'd been there, you know, they would have been able to get a little closer to the microphone or whatever. So I'm, I do think it's a great idea, but I'm, I'm really thinking it's much more something where you have to have a, a study committee who knows how to do this and who looks, frankly, why, why would we reinvent the wheel? They're, they're gonna be, everybody's gonna be trying to do this to get these hybrid models up and working. Why should it be just us who tries to do it in Arlington by ourselves without looking at what works for other people? Um, and also, uh, I forgot what the other thing was. Um, but basically, I, I'm very much in favor of it as a, like I said, as a non-binding resolution, everybody would go, yeah, absolutely. Be open meeting, get more sunshine in there, get more people talking. But I think you've really got to think about the logistics more than the, and not make assumptions about what kind of tech people can afford, what kind of tech people can use. And I, yeah, I don't know a virtual town meeting. I know that um, moderator Leon did a survey about this and got some responses, but it changes some things about the way meetings oh, we go. Oh, three minutes. If you can just wrap up your thought. It's, it's that it does affect how meetings go and who gets to talk. And, you know, I'm looking here, was I this number on the list? I don't know. When I'm running a meeting, I don't necessarily see somebody's hand right away. So I don't know that I'm calling on them in the order that they raise their hand. There's like some sort of disenfranchisement that takes place in these sorts of teleconferences as well. And I think we have to be, that has to be part of the solution is you have to figure out a way around that. For all I know, 
maybe everybody needs a tech person to work with them when they have a committee meeting so that there's a tech person who's getting the people on who can't get on and you know all of these meetings are a little rough still at the beginning and we've been doing them for what nine months so i'd like to say yes absolutely and somebody smart needs to figure it out and look at what other people are doing thanks all right mr seltzer Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I speak from the perspective of a resident who has frequently attended meetings of various boards and committees, both before and during COVID. Unlike the select board, most town committee and board meetings have taken place in small conference rooms with limited seating. Visual materials were often set up on easels that could be seen only by the committee members. Hard copy handouts were distributed only to committee, committee members. If a hearing was of a special interest, it could draw far more residents than the annex conference rooms could hold. Some members of the public would stand outside in the hallway, hoping to catch some of the discussions. Others just gave up and left. Sometimes the chair would anticipate the higher turnout and book the senior center or another large room. While this, although this provided enough seats for everyone, the acoustics were usually terrible. You had to grab a seat in the first or second row to have a chance of hearing what was going on. On a few occasions, I was the lone member of the public attending, either because of an inconvenient early morning meeting or because of bad weather. Zoom meetings have changed all of that. I've seen a large rise in public involvement and a better knowledge of the issues facing the town. I think that is a good thing. I understand the legal argument for board and committee members to be physically present and together, but no such restrictions apply to the public. I think that this discussion this evening has been muddled a bit by different understandings of what public participation is. Merely being able to attend an open meeting and observing is public participation. I strongly urge this board to support the continuation of this virtual option for the public to attend remotely and to provide the necessary and resources for this to be implemented. Thank you. Ms. Kiesel. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Laura Kiesel. I'm at 260 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I'm calling tonight to pledge my support for this article, and I'm going to offer just some input from a disability perspective. Uh, last year, which was the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I worked on a piece um, with the Christian Science Monitor as a journalist, a multimedia piece about remote access. Um, becoming more the norm and mainstream for disabled people subsequent to the COVID pandemic, because even though it qualified as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA, the courts were mixed and a lot of workplaces were still denying disabled people. Um, even though that's specific to the workplace, I still think a lot of the things that were discussed in that piece are relevant now, namely like as a disabled person, I know that I've been asking for remote access even in town participation for a while. When COVID happened, suddenly it made something that a lot of marginalized people have been asking for for years really happen in a matter of days or weeks, which showed it wasn't a matter of cost it was a matter of willpower. And suddenly when the access needs were something that everyone was experiencing, we could get above the hump of cost. We could get above all these like concerns about technical um, glitches and we just made it happen. And I would really not like to see us go back. Um, when I was doing this piece, I spoke to several lawyers um, and I actually brought up uh, municipal um, access via remote. Uh, I spoke to Matt, Matthew Portland, who's a very popular um, and well-known disability advocate lawyer about uh, participation in town meeting for disabled people. And he thought that this established a precedent 
under the ADA for reasonable accommodation to have remote options for disabled people upon request. I spoke to the Disability Rights Division of the Attorney General's office and they too thought that this might reasonably um, establish a precedent for um, if people needed it. I was talking specific to the um, AG's office about um, town meeting if disabled people needed it. And I spoke to another lawyer who also felt like this established a legal precedent um, specific to disabled people if they needed a reasonable accommodation for town meeting at other town um, committees or commissions to be able to access it. I agree with Len Diggins that it could be more difficult to do hybrid right now. And so my argument would be, well, then let's keep it all remote until we can more reasonably have um, a decent hybrid alternative. Otherwise, I think you're going to start shutting out a lot of marginalized people who have suddenly had access to these meetings who now will not. So that's what I wanted to offer for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Lynette Martin. Hi, um, thank you very much. My name is Lynette Martin, uh, Eustace Street. Um, I, I too find it really um, great to hear how much support there is for this. Um, I'd like to hear more ways of making it happen as opposed to reasons for not making it happen. Um, you know, we're talking about studio, creating studio rooms, but that could be a goal. We can easily get this done with laptops um, as someone stated. And as far as um, Ms. Devaney mentioned, like, what about the people that don't have great internet connection? Well, before we did Zoom, what about the people that couldn't even access the room? I mean, this is definitely moving us towards more people being able to be there. It might not be perfect, but like, again, you don't wanna not do anything because you're trying to, to get it perfect the first time out. Um, and, the costs, whatever the costs are, clearly this is a priority and it's going to be prioritized by the community. So I think that we, we find the money. I mean, I was just sitting on the last select board meeting where there are mil millions of dollars to like renovate pieces of land and stuff. I mean, we need to prioritize getting disabled people to be able to access these meetings and find the money somewhere. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out um, again how um, demeaning certain select board members can be to the community. Um, Chairperson Mahone uh, was continually rolling her eyes during testimony on research that Ms. Kiesel did, which I had not heard and found useful and informative, has been shaking her head no the whole time. And um, I found it really upsetting, um, her comments about, you know, mentioning that she has two disabled children, but that she was able to make it happen. And if people want to access it, they'll make it happen. It's just not, it's so offensive to people who want to make it happen and can't make it happen. There's a lot of privilege in having two disabled children and being able to make it to meetings. Um, perhaps you have other family members at home. Perhaps you have enough money to pay for a sitter. Um, you know, there are people that are working multiple jobs, as people said, they have to call in from their jobs or from their commute. Um, there are people that can't make it because they can't get up the stairs because they, they have disabled in, uh, disabling injuries. Sitting in the select board meetings in particular for long periods of time can be very difficult even for a person with a back problem. I myself have had to bring in stuff to sit in the select board meetings, special pillows and stuff. So um, I just think that we need to continue to think about how we are addressing the community and how words matter and be more careful about the statements that we're making when we address these issues of accessibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lynette Culverhouse. Hi, my name is Lynette Culverhouse, uh, Draper Avenue. Thank you um, for allowing me to comment on this very important article. I wanna offer my support and urge the select board to find a way to um, work with Ms. Dre to, to um, allow uh, this kind of access uh, to continue after we're back to in-person meetings. Um, for me, this is about democracy and civic engagement. This is about um, allowing participation 
for um, a multitude of voices that don't normally get heard. This is about um, allowing you as our leaders to be, become better leaders by having access to more opinions and more ideas and more, um, more of people's realities. Um, so I am urging you to look at this from the perspective of human beings rather than um, the complications or the cost. As Must Mustafa uh, said, there, there have been numerous um, businesses that conduct um, hybrid meetings across, across the world with uh, in-person participation at the same time as remote participation. And I'm sure that within Arlington, we have such people who could help us figure out a way to make this happen. So I urge this board, please make this happen for the sake of, of, of our residents and uh, our democracy. Thank you. And Sarah McKinnon. You're on mute. First time for everything. Hi, <laughs> my name is Sarah McKinnon and I live on Kilsyth Road. And I wanted to also speak in support um, of this article. Um, I've been an Arlington resident for six years. Um, I have uh, young children and the remote access this year has completely transformed my ability to participate and to be informed and to meet quite a few people that I wasn't meeting um, because of their common interests in the things that um, they chose to, spoke, to speak on. Um, I wanted to also uh, speak up for um, Laura Kiesel's suggestion that um, we're all online now. We've been doing this for a year. We're pretty good at it. It's not perfect. Um, I do think that internet access is a um, good internet access is a key concern and some people even speak of this as a human right. Um, when we think about people who are trying to um, enroll for vaccinations right now and they don't have internet access, this is something that we in the town can work on to help people gain secure, um, good quality internet access and may even be less expensive than outfitting rooms. Um, you have a momentum now you have people really engaged and it's hard to do that you're competing with a really busy world. And I would be sad to think that we would lose that momentum at this moment by getting tied up in the details of, can we afford it? What's the structure? We're doing it already. And I think we could continue doing this for now, not rush back to in-person at the um, cost of losing real civic engagement. Thank you very much. All right, and so that closes the public commentary. So I'll go back to the board. So we do have a motion for no action that's been seconded. I'll also entertain if the board has any competing motions or amendments. I think at this point, if you fuse the comments together, everyone supports where we're going with this, but we also, I think with a mandate like it is, we need to kind of pare it down a little bit. And I would just say, I mean, again, I don't want to keep saying I'm not the technology person like I'm, you know, 100 years old, but the, I anticipate just to, to say that, you know, if we study this, I don't anticipate that we need a gap because I can look at myself sitting in a select board chamber with my laptop and my Bluetooth speaker from my backyard that, you know, at least gives that option if we don't have the technology to wire it in, then at least, you know, the board hears the public comment. So with that, uh, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd say, first off, I actually don't think it is easy. And with all due respect to uh, some of the pre previous speakers about, uh, for instance, the concept about an iPad or using laptops, uh, this is actually something that I try to, do. I run a company meeting every week and I've done it in, in it ranges in size. Like, doing a meeting in person or, or that's a hybrid that's like 10 people or 15 people is not that hard with the right things 
But when you get to like 50, it's hard because you need the all 50 people to hear the speaker. And so uh, I guess there's like, for instance, one suggestion, you know, hold up the iPad and then the iPad can do it. And I can assure you that if Ms. Dre was trying to give her presentation from an iPad at the front of the select board chambers, the people in the back room, in the back of the room would not be uh, pleased with that. But that's, so, but I'm not saying this to say no, I just, I'm saying it just to say it's not easy. Um, but what I would like us, I, I would like to, us to get to yes. And um, the version of yes that I would like to suggest is that we model the uh, election modernization committee. And what we did is we looked at a set of problems and we said, let's create a short lived committee that exists for a year or two that's specifically uh, here to address this specific problem. And so um, I sketched here in my the, uh, nine people. I said nominee from the select board, school committee, ARB, the town manager and the disability commission and four town meeting members appointed by the moderator. Uh, and I think we should charge the committee to have an interim report by October 1st. And I choose that date so they can be engaged in any capital purchases. Um, then that they have a report for spring of 22. Uh, I want them to evaluate what meetings are appropriate for this, what portion of the meetings are appropriate for it and what much it costs. And I want them to dissolve in the spring of 23. And the reason I say spring of 23 is because that gives them a year. Uh, to, like put, frankly, I think the select board should step first. Easy for me to say, because this may or may not be my last meeting, right? Uh, but I think we should step first and we should have remote participation when we come back in uh, for Citizens Open Forum. And then I think that we should be able to learn from it and that committee should be able to learn from it and see how it extends to other committees. And that's why I give the committee a two-year lifespan is uh, to permit a two-year arc of learning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, and just mark your calendars. I think we do have a meeting on April 5th. So any additional comments, Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, fortunately, I'm proof tonight of, of poor internet access, but um, I'll, I'll second Mr. Dunn's motion. Um, and I, I also appreciate what the town manager said earlier about endorsing a plan, but I, I, I think we should step first, and, and we had talked um, briefly about the, the possible return to the chamber. And I think while, as long as we're in the state of emergency, it would be in a hybrid type setting. But I think it, there, there are some logistical issues. The, and, and because we're in the state of emergency, the governor's order expects the open meeting law. So we don't know how that's going to turn out exactly. But I, um, from my comments earlier, I support trying to do that uh, with the select board and seeing if we can expand it further. So I, I, I like uh, Mr. Dunn's idea. Um, I, I also, earlier, I, I did have some confusion between what was, may have been presented to finance committee, what was presented to us, because it sounded like it may have been a couple different things. And if it's an appropriation, the finance committee's vote is going to be what's before town meeting. So this is a separate action um, by Mr. Dunn. And I think it's, People may think it's too long a, a period, but I mean, I think if we're committed to trying to make this work at the select board level, um, we're, we're going to get out ahead of this. All right. Mr. Higgins? Thank you, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Um, so um, through you, Mr. Chair, to um, Mr. Dunn. I mean, so would the committee have the ability to report out sooner? Than yeah, the committee can say and do whatever it wants. It's just required. Uh, it is required to make a report before October 1st. And right. the, the reason there is both uh, the intent is both to capture the capital purchase cycle and frankly, just to um, capture some of the urgency of the proponents. Right. So as long as you can report out sooner, I mean, that's fine because because we, 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 yeah, we, we don't want to miss opportunities to, um, well, I'll just stop there. Um, so okay, I'm fine with that, and and uh, I just a, a couple of comments to uh, me thinking. Yeah, I, I generally will think both sides of an issue, and, and as as much as I have enjoyed the remote access, and, um, and I know other people have too. 
I, I wonder to what extent we more people are participating because there's just nothing else to do. You know? So it's like when we get back to normal, I mean, you can go out to dinner with friends, I mean, and do other things. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what participation looks like then. I'm still in favor of this, I mean, but I'm just kind of like wondering what's going to happen when people have alternatives. You know? And um, the other thing too that I want to emphasize uh, is, is that um, I mean, uh, along with the participation, what I really like is the fact that these meetings are recorded, you know, and, uh, and, and I would like to see us also move to a model where those recordings are accessible. I mean, so whatever we study, let's think about how we can give people non real time access uh, to these meetings because they're enlightening, um, even afterwards, and sometimes you can go through them at 2x and it takes less time and skip through the parts that aren't terribly interesting, like when select board members in yellow shirts are talking. And um, yeah, um, so another thing is um, the just the, it will be a, a real uh, desire, a real incentive, I think, for us to work on providing um, better internet access for folks. I don't know if that's something we can do locally, but I think it's something that we can put post our legislators, our state delegates uh, to, to work on because that will benefit us all. I mean, um, not only for these remote meeting, meetings. So that's it, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm a little confused just because it's me. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing is in for, in, Regard to Article 20, um, motion I, I made by Mr. Diggins of no action is still on the table. But if Mr. Dunn, who this is probably his last meeting, could explain again what it, it is he's proposing. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mohan. I, so I do recognize your motion is on the floor. And so I'm, but I'm definitely suggesting an alternate path that I would, that I would be inclined to support. Uh, I don't, Think I don't endorse, or I'm not ready to go with the proponents. Do all committees now effectively? In which I may be putting two words, but I, I'm not. I'm not ready to go that hard that fast. But I do like the idea, and I do think that we should encourage remote participation. And so what I'm saying is, do what we did with the election modernization committee. We created a committee that was a, effectively a special purpose committee. With a very specific time frame and a very specific set of um, a problem to look at, and give them a time a, a membership and a timeline that they're supposed to report back to town meeting. Okay, and what is this committee that you're proposing? That is not Ms. Dre's committee, which the original article that's before us is no action. Which I'm hearing that maybe that's what you're supporting, no action. But creating an additional committee. Who's on this committee? Uh, no, I was I was actually suggesting it becoming a town meeting committee. Um, I wasn't suggesting no action. Uh, I, I was saying nine members, um, and they, these are definitely off the cuff, so I, they could be changed. Uh, select board, school committee, ARB appointee from each one of those. Appointee from the ARB is number four because I, I was picking the big committees, so to speak, the ones with the most public involvement. Town manager representative from the Dis disability commission and then four town meeting members appointed by the moderator so that's nine committee members yes so, and, and what what is their charge because my thing is i, I understand what mr a is trying to do she she's saying for all she's saying for public participation for select board meetings but she's applying it to the 113 plus uh town committees that we have so what is it that this nine member uh, committee would, would look into? Just they to should evaluate board. What, me what meetings should enable remote participation, what portions of that meeting. So in my mind, they could say they, they might, uh, this is again off the top, they may look at the select board meetings and say, citizens open forum is the only appropriate place. Or they may say everything where you'd invite the in, in the, like uh, we'd look to them for the recommendations there and how much it costs. Those are the three elements of the charge that I thought of. So what you're saying is that um, the select board should abdicate their meetings and the control of their meetings to this nine member body to um, disseminate what they should be doing, which I'm not in agreement with. 
I would disagree with your characterizations, Mrs. Mohan. I would say that uh, I'm suggesting that we turn the select board meetings into a laboratory for the rest of the town to learn and adopt from. So you think that the select board is not competent enough to um, be able to designate what should be um, public meeting, remote meeting, and somebody else needs to guide us on that? I again disagree with your characterization, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah, but you're, you're creating a committee to say that. If you're not, say that's not what you're doing, and we that, won't have to be guided by that. That's not what I'm doing, Mrs. Mahan, but I do look forward to their recommendations, and I think that they're, we can learn, and I think that the other committees can learn as well. So again, you're saying that you want to abdicate the select board meetings to this nine-member committee. Let's not go back and forth on this. I, th I think we've... No, no, but m m excuse me, honestly. I, I know Mr. Don, this is his last meeting. I can, he can do a big brouhaha, but I have to live with what he's speaking to, okay? And my thing is, I think the select board should be in charge of and, and designate what their agenda is. And Mr. Dunn, in my opinion, and I'm asking him to correct me if I'm wrong, is saying he wants to create this nine member committee to say what the select board's charge should be. And if that's not the case, say that's not the case. And then I'll vote for his committee, which means they're really not doing anything. But my understanding is that what Dan is suggesting is a committee to study the feasibility of remote participation make recommendations as to what what meetings and what boards and commissions it's feasible to use it the cost the the committee could come back to us and say this is wildly unfeasible and just recommend to tell me that they not do any action re regarding remote participation but as opposed to just voting no action and saying we don't want to to continue the remote participation or and as opposed to voting for the article as proposed that says that we all have to we're going to have appoint a committee that tells us or tells town meeting what where it's feasible to have public participation to keep it the tenor of the comments that you know we value the increased participation that remote has offered and, and that's not my understanding ms dre's original warren article which i voted no action on targets the select board uh citizen public participation and mr dunn has made a motion on how to study that and i mean if the rest of my colleagues want to abdicate our select board duties that's fine but i'm not in favor of that so I'm I'm still on my motion of no action, and I'm not trying to be like overly dramatic, but I think people are trying to go along to get along. Ms. Dre presented a Warren article that I think we're not all in favor of, that we're trying to find a way that we can do something that placates her, and if it's no action, it's no action. But if, if people don't want to stand up for that, that's fine, but we are the select board. Attorney and Heim. Mr. Don, this is the last meeting. God bless you. Attorney Heim. So if you can answer the question, what, what the, you, I think you can understand the intent of where Mr. Dunn is going to essentially send amended language to town meeting and not the article as proposed. Do we need a vote of no action on the article or can we vote on Mr. Dunn's amended language? Does that question make sense? It does. So if, Within the scope of the Warren article, while the moderator is the ultimate authority with respect to scope, my understanding is that the two competing motions are a motion, a, mo a motion of no action, which is very straightforward. It's just no action. That's it. And then the other proposal is uh, the, the select board, you know, votes to, you know, study this issue and report back on it. So they're 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 different things. Um, I appreciate. The, Discussion among the board, but they're the different things. You can, you can do either, but they're not they're not synonymous. Right. So, do we need a vote of no action in addition to Mr. Dunn's sub amended language? No. Your your vote is if if you're if the board is inclined to vote as Mr. Dunn has uh, proposed, then your vote is this is the action we're going to take. 
we want to study this issue. We want to create a committee, study the issue, and report back. And um, it's it's a no action vote would, would basically mean that there's no discussion before town meeting. Okay. Any additional comments, Mr. Diggins? So I mean, essentially, I, I have a question, I mean, to Mr. Hyman, because I'm just not clear myself. So then, if we vote no on the no action, then we are voting for Mr. Dunn's proposal. No, no. You, there there are two separate motions before the board uh, right now, Mr. Diggins. Okay. You can, uh, you'd have to vote on the motion for, as it st presently stands. You have to vote on the no action motion first. Okay. Um, because that's right. the primary motion, unless right. you want to vote to change the uh, motion to uh, Mr. Dunn's motion. Uh, but you have to dispose of the no action one way or the other. I just don't want to, I don't want I don't want to make it synonymous for you that, that if you don't want, if you want to take the no action proposal, you vote yes or no on that. But your other options are to vote to amend that motion to a motion of, uh, you know, create a committee to study the issue. Um, either way, you're in substance doing the same thing. Gotcha, gotcha. I was just wasn't clear if it was like two votes or or I see. I understand now. Sorry. Okay. All right. So then, so then. All right. We'll see what happens. That happens next. I'm done, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are you make, making a motion to amend the vote of no action? As you, Mr. Chair, if I can recommend the the simplest course of action is to vote down the no action and then take up a second motion okay attorney Han, we have a vote of no action that's been seconded um on a motion by miss mahan and uh seconded by mr diggins a vote of no action mrs mahan yes mr de Corsi. no mr diggins no mr dunn no Mr. Hurd. No. Okay, the no action vote uh, is a four to one vote. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Dunn. I move the creation, the move that we recommend the creation of a remote participation committee as I outlined um, a couple minutes ago. We have a second. Second. Any additional comments, Mr. Diggins? Still muted. Just shake your head if the answer is no. Mrs. Mahan. Um, could Mr. Dunn um, once again state the committee, the parameters and the cost, please, sure. of the 113 to 20 committees that we have? Uh, that we create the, the committee to study uh, the uh, remote participation. The committee should have nine members. Um, rep a nominee of the select board, a nominee of the school committee, a nominee of the ARB, a nominee of the town manager, a nominee of the disability commission, and four town meeting members to be nominated by the moderator. Uh, the, the charge uh, of the committee is to respond by at, the, at least October 1st with a preliminary report and a report for the spring of 22 and for the spring of 23. That the, during the course of their activities that they should evaluate what meetings should ha have uh, remote participation, what portion of those meetings should have remote participation and evaluate the cost thereof. And, and that includes all town and school committees, boards and subcommittees. Yes. And so Thank just to be, to, to be clear, when I say what meetings, I'm not, uh, that part of what I'm asking them to evaluate is whether it should apply to all committees or only some of them. Yeah, yeah but my question is, of the 120 to 130 committees, commissions, agencies, recreation departments, et cetera, those all need to be looked at. Yes. So that's the charge for this committee. And you won't be on the board anymore. So that God bless you. Okay. God bless that committee that you want to create. We have a motion in a second. Attorney Hine. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. 
Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Drake. Thought, yeah. All right, that brings us to Article 24, tabled from our last meeting, Home Rule Legislation Ranked Choice Voting. We have Mr. Dennis with us. <coughs> All right, Mr. Dennis, you just say your name again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm Greg Dennis. I'm the clerk of the Election Modernization Committee. Um, thank you for um, taking up this article. Again, I'm looking into it uh, with a lot of consideration. As you see in your materials and received by email, uh, the Election Modernization Committee submitted further comment on the ranked choice voting article. Um, the committee just wanted to clarify its opinion with respect to the two options you heard about two weeks ago. We have our original uh, proposal, we're calling the proportional proposal and the modified proposal um, as put forward by Mr. Oster, which we're calling the majoritarian proposal, and they differ in how the multi-seat elections um, are determined. Um, at the prior hearing, the, bird, the board heard some objections from Mr. Schleckman and Mr. Oster to our original proposal, and our committee just wanted to make clear that if the board feels those objections carry any weight or gives you pause, we think the right thing to do is to put forward a positive recommendation for the majoritarian option as uh, advocated by Mr. Oster. That option would address the concern <clears throat> and would mean that our proposal would be, um, the proposal put forward would be unlikely to face substantive amendments or substitute motions, uh, substitute motions at town meeting. Uh, so if you're looking for a compromise position that's unlikely to face real opposition, that one is available to you. Um, we would strongly prefer one of those two options appear before town meeting over um, for further delay or postponement. All right, thank you. I'll turn to the board for any questions, comments, or motions. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I really appreciate the work and the extra thought that uh, we got back from the Election Modernization Committee. And I think it was um, uh, very instructive. I think that the um, proportional voting that that is in the that there that is one of the proposals they put forward. It's uh, it's got a lot of implications, and I think it's the type of thing that really uh, that the, the town meeting and the rest of the town may come around to over time. But uh, I think that our making that case takes a longer runway than we've got, and uh, I do I agree with the with the election modernization committee that ranked choice voting is better in all in me, most respects. And uh, so therefore I've got a very practical view that I think that we should move forward with the majoritarian because I think that we can get that through town meeting and through a ballot question. Um, so I move that we recommend favorable action on the proposal specific, with specifically the majoritarian version. Senator Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will second Mr. Dunn's motion for discussion and then I, I, I want to thank Mr. Dennis and all the speakers last time and, and again thank all the work that the election modernization committee has done. Um, I'm, I still have an issue between single seat and multi seats and, and I understand that the, the will of the board may be to go forward on a, on a multi seat. I, I could support rank choosing for a single seat election see how that works and then maybe look later on whether it should be expanded to multi-seat. But I, I think the issues that were raised at the last meeting for the research that I have done on it, I'm, I'm still concerned about the, the multi-seat election. So um, depending on how this goes down, I may ask for some comments that um, while I support a single seat ranked choice right now, um, given where the discussion has gone and some of the challenges, um, I don't support a multi-seat at this time. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, similar to what Mr. DeCourcy said, uh, 
going into this, I was 100% aboard on ranked choice voting, but then um, one of the statements was that um, campaigns would not be as competitive uh, and would get out more on an even playing field. But if, if I was in a multi-choice uh, election, whereas in the past, I would say, can you give me one of your two votes? And if you were on school committee, you could say, can you give me one of your three votes? I need to change my campaign strategy to say, can you give me your number one vote? And to me, that makes it more adversarial. Um, uh, and, and that kind of turned me away from uh, ranked uh, ch choice voting in multi um, ranked elections. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of back on the fence. I thought I was 100% on board on this, but then when I saw that the, the, the purpose that I was, was kind of buying into this, that it would turn into, oh, it's going to be a less competitive race. No, it's not. It's going to be, if you're in a two, three person race or more, um, you're not saying, give me one of your two or three votes. You're saying, give me your number one. Um, and um, that's sort of not the environment that I want to run in. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I like proportional, but I'm going to support me, the majoritarian, because I want to get this in front of town meeting. Town meeting is going to work as well on it. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. I see. I, I hear Mr. Slickman's argument me that we, you've reduced two votes to me you know, or multiple votes down to one. I see it as a voting experience. You know, and so, so he, and I see it as an experience that engages me more with all of the candidates meet. And so, so now I feel that I have more impact on all the candidates and now all of them may have an interest in reaching out to me because in the current system, they can just say, you know what, me, um, I'm not interested in you. You're in a certain camp, me and, and, and just discard me or not, or not paying attention to me. Now they have an interest in reaching out to me. So I think it engages more. I'm not concerned you know, about the fact that you may get a you know, um, uh, a candidate that differs from the majority and that may threaten grants. I mean, I mean, I mean first off, I think that's hypothetical. I mean, and, but give it the, give it credit. I mean, uh, I, I think it then becomes incumbent upon I me and the majority to work I me mean, with that candidate I mean, uh, or, or that, that person that's won uh, has a seat to convince them that I mean, their position is correct. You could end up with I me mean, some really bad person uh, but that's a risk. I mean, that's a risk we take in democracy, and and, and so I support um, I support this, and and and, and um, it's um, I think it's yeah. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And I would say I want I just reiterate again that you know I I do wish that there was a process where we were able to get more public education on this before the vote gets taken, but. You know, I did talk to Attorney Heim about my suggestion on the last one about doing a ballot question prior to the town meeting vote. And it didn't sound like that was really feasible. Correct, Attorney Heim? So, yeah, I, I think if I think the, the, the suggestion is a good one in so far that you could gauge the public sort of perspective on it before you submitted special legislation. The board has the ability to submit a non-binding ballot question on, on anything that it wants. Um, but the way that uh, special legislation is typically structured, you would submit the special legislation and then it would go to the voters for ratification rather than the other way around, um, similar to the way that we do everything from, you know, um, I, I don't want to make the comparison. In some ways, I don't want to make the comparison. There's a little bit of the way we use uh, package store licenses or alcohol licenses. Uh, you get the authority to make the request first and then you submitted to the voters for ratification. The only processes that I could find that are more direct are something that's specifically highlighted in the statute, like the conversion of, a, uh, of an office or something like that. Yeah, all right. And I certainly understand, I, we've had great presentations and I've had great conversations with opponents of, and people that were not in favor of, of ranked choice voting in the interim since our last meeting. And I, I definitely think it's something that that can be helpful in our current
election system <clears throat> the right information out to people i think I, I would lean towards just for reasons stated by mr don lean towards the the majoritarian view over the proportional at this time but i certainly want to hear what the public commentary comes up with as well um so with that i will turn to the public comments and the first one is from jennifer seuss Sorry for all the delays. Hi, um, so thank you for uh, considering this proposal and for your sort of very thoughtful um, commentary. I've had some conversations with some, some people. Um, I wanna urge you not to make a choice to propose ranked choice voting only for single seat elections. I think that gets very complicated, especially on for the select board where there is a, a year with a single seat election and two years with a multi-seat election. Um, some of the worries that you've heard about the multi-seat elections for ranked choice voting are specific to the proportional representation. I understand why uh, the committee at this point feels that that might be um, too complicated to explain, too, um, too open to uh, worries. Um, it certainly does potentially change the relationship between the board and the community. There, there, I understand why people aren't, don't want to care. Um, but, but then I, I would say, if, we do, if you do decide to put forward majoritarian ranked choice voting, um, some of the worries that you've heard so far just really aren't there. I mean, you don't really have um, any worry about grants. You don't have, um, the public just doesn't have to worry about this complex counting process. You know, there's just, it, there's just a lot that goes away. And so to remind you of the good things about ranked choice voting, so ranked choice voting encourages participation. So more people run without worrying about spoiling, spoiling another candidate. And so when you talk about you know, whether this will promote a more friendly campaign or a more contentious ca campaign, the reason it might be more friendly is just for that reason. Because you aren't worried that by running that you're there for threatening somebody else's uh, possibilities who you might like very much. And so that's why they're sort of this friendly competitive thing. Um, it does um, increase, because it increases the participation, potentially there'll be more people running for office, there'll be more people interested in the election, interested in what these boards do and the other offices, and more likely to come out and vote. You just get sort of more people involved in the electoral process. So when we're looking for things that we could do in town, um, so. I should, I didn't introduce myself, did I? <laughs> Jennifer Seuss, uh, Teal Street. I'm also a member of the Election Modernization Committee. When we're looking for things in town, things that we could do to improve the electoral process, um, getting more people involved, getting more excitement about these elections was a really important part of that. The other thing it will do that's really crucial is it reduces gamesmanship. So right now, as everybody knows, uh, some people know that there's this, bullet possibility. Some people don't know about the bullet possibility. Um, some people use it, some people don't. In general, there's sort of this gamesmanship that goes on now that you just don't have to do with ranked choice voting. And that's, I think, a really nice thing. Um, the other thing is that it, it increases, um, it, it sort of better reflects the will of the voters. And I know there's a debate about the two kinds of ranked choice voting for multi-C elections. And the committee does strongly feel that proportional better reflects the will of the voters, but I would argue that they both reflect the will of the voters better because people can sort of express their preferences. I really like this person and I like this person second, and you know, maybe I don't like this person. It just, it's a much better relationship the voter has to the voting process. So I'd encourage you to um, put this before a town meeting. There's going to be lots and lots of opportunity to explain it to town meeting members, lots of opportunities to explain it to the voters before it comes to a vote. Um, this is not the end of the sort of education conversation. It's just really the very beginning. Um, and so I, I, I urge you to, to take that step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sean from ACMI, can you hear, uh, hear me? I'm, get, I'm getting a few texts that the cable is out on the broadcast. Let 
No? Okay. All right, we'll move on. All right, Mr. Schlickman. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, when, when we started with the liquor licenses, we started with beer and wine only in restaurants. And we went from moist in, until about 10 years uh, later, we now have full alcohol services, package stores, full uh, expanded our all alcohol licenses. So we took it step by step. If this board votes to advance rank choice voting for only single seat elections. I think that's a reasonable starting point to put it before the voters and do it that way and see where we go. Ranked choice voting on a multi-seat election does not do what the proponents state based on uh, how it would in theory work for single seat elections. Do you know of anybody in town who said, gee, I would really like to run for office, but I don't want to do it in this way, but I will run for office under ranked choice voting. I've not met that person. I have not met that person. Uh, the, and as a person who was elected under a three person race, I, I want to be very clear. Bill Hainer and I are very good friends. We do not share political constituencies. I tell people all the time, please vote for me. I like Bill. Give him one of your three votes as well. And he does the same. The current system for multi-seat elections promotes far more cooperation and collaboration than a ranked choice scheme where I have to say, Bill's a nice guy, but I need your number one vote. Alice Wolf once said, if I get everybody's number two vote in the election, I lose because ranked choice starts with the number one votes. Gaming the system, ranked choice doesn't solve that. It just changes the game on a multi-seat election. And so that you have to adjust your campaign strategy to a new set of rules. And I think the new set of rules for a multi-seat election is less friendly, less cooperative, more adversarial. If there is ranked choice voting in the proposal, I will go to town meeting with an amendment to remove it for multi-choice, and I will work to defeat the article. If we advance a ranked choice voting for only single seat races, I think that it's reasonable to put it before the voters and see if they like it or not. So the compromise position is not between which kind of multi-seat ranked choice you want to do. The compromise is put forward the most basic uh, ranked choice for the single seat elections and see where that goes. And I don't agree with the argument that it's more complicated than uh, having ranked choice for everything because the multi-seat ranked choice <laughs> is a very complicated process to do it for single seat elections when the select board has only one member up, it's just one name, one, one seat on the ballot, rank choice rules apply. When there are two seats up, rank choice rules don't apply. Pretty easy. So I urge you, do not go past a single seat rank choice uh, proposal going to town meeting this year, because that my friends is the compromise. Thank you. Mr. Oster. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, Adam Oster. I live at uh, 10 Cottage Avenue in East Arlington. And really, I just wanted to express my great appreciation for the work of this committee. Um, They've been energetic. Uh, they've been thoughtful. Uh, I haven't agreed with them about everything, but it's really been a pleasure to interact with them. I hope the board will do what they think is, is right and let town meeting sort it out. Those are my comments. Thank you. Yep. Now I'll close the public commentary section of this meeting.
So we do have a motion to approve that's been seconded. So I will go back to the board for any additional comments or questions for the proponents. Mr. Corsi? I, I don't have any further questions. All right, Mr. Dunn? Um, I guess my one comment is that I don't agree with uh, entirely with Mr. Schlickman's characterization either. Like, I think that one, th so for instance, the, re the relationship he said about, you know, voting for the, the like, uh, the person who only gets the second votes can't win. That was true under the proportional version, but that's not the ver the majoritarian version that I'm putting forward uh, to, does not have that flaw, uh, uh, or at least that I'll even, it just doesn't have that characteristic. Um, and so, I, I understand that Mr. Schlickman thinks that the compromise is to do only a single seat, but I would say that the compromise is to do majoritarian. Um, and I understand that Mr. DeCourcy isn't comfortable with that. And so, and I, I guess I'm kind of, I, I look to uh, the will of my colleagues on which direction to go for majority. Uh, and I'll be happy to support um, however that comes out. All right, Mr. Diggins. I'm very much in favor in of uh, doing right choice for multi seat in and and I'm I'm fine with going with the uh, majoritarian since that seems to be the way that you seems to what makes you comfortable, Mr. Dunn. Uh, and so uh, because I'd like to see it in the multi seat, I'm going to support that. Thank you. This is mine. Um, I guess I would ask Mr. Dunn. And Mr. DeCourcy, um, is what I'm hearing from the vote uh, majoritarian or multi-seat? I think if I would, um, Mr. De Mr. DeCourcy, I'll take a stab and you can see if I get your get it right. So, uh, so last time we heard about this, we heard about proportional for multi-seat. And tonight we're hearing about it. We heard we got in writing at least the majoritarian for multi seat. And I'm supporting the majoritarian for multi seat. And Mr. DeCourcy is suggesting don't make a change for multi seat voting. So, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, look at it in a ranked choice type analogy. My, my first choice is to do it for single seat. My second choice would be do, to do majoritarian. And my third choice would be proportional. And I want to have a voice. So I want to tell you where, what I think about it. I, I think we should go forward on single seat. I think maybe down the road, maybe it will be appropriate to extend it to multi-seat. I'm not ready to do it now. I think it needs a little bit more um, outreach and, 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 and work. But uh, here's your example. There's my three preferences. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And I agree with Mr. DeCourcy on single seat. So that will be my vote, which I think means I may not be voting for Mr. Dunn's motion. Okay. All right. And Mr. Dennis, can you just explain, because I know this has been said and I had a conversation with Ms. Seuss about this and she explained it to me, but sometimes it just doesn't go through my head. So why is it that the proportional that takes away the, the problem with having two votes in in a multi-seat election? No, the proportion, sorry. Why is it the majoritarian takes, takes away the problem? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So in a multi-seat election, in a proportional system, you get one vote. So your vote could count for you sort of spend your vote on a candidate. Yep. And if that candidate needs sort of 80% of your vote to get elected, then you get 80% of your vote going to that candidate and 20% to the next candidate or so on. Um, in a majoritarian, you get, it retains the, the um, reality or feature or bug, however you wanna see it that we have today where you effectively get as many votes as there are seats. So it would not be changing that aspect. The way it's counted is you um, count it as if it's a single seat election, that person gets the first seat. And then for the next seat, you again count it as if it's a single seat election, only you um, exclude the whoever won the, the first seat and so on. You just continue the same process, applying the same process you used to elect a single seat election uh, repetitively in excluding the prior winners so that because somebody can't win two seats. Um, so uh, that's how it works and 
like Mr. Dunn said, the criticism that, you know, Alice Wolf complained about this or that or said this or that would not apply to the majoritarian proposal. And um, I think it really defangs um, the objections that you've heard to, to rank choice for multi-seat elections. All right, so Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve that has been seconded. Um, Mr. Hurd, uh, I, I think we're, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're at, uh, we've got two people who think that we should do rank choice and two people who we think should do single seat. Do you wanna reveal which, which way you're gonna vote? So <laughs> the beauty of chair, right? Is, I mean, I think, where I am is, you know, I just, I don't, there's going to be a robust discussion in town meeting and that discussion will, regardless of how we vote is going to take place on both sides of this issue. So I think at, at this point, I would be inclined to support your motion and pass it along to town meeting to at least, you know, put, not necessitate the need for one of the, the substitute motions. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Attorney Heim. Just so I make sure I understand the, the motion is for um, single is, is, is for single and multi uh, multi under the majoritarian uh, form of multi seat uh, selection, correct? Okay. On a motion by, uh, I believe, Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Diggins, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy. No. <clears throat> Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. The vote is four to one. The motion carries. Thank you. We'll clear out a few nights of town meeting for this one. All right, that takes us to Article 26, <laughs> CBG application. Is that Mr. Helmuth? Good evening. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Um, I'm Mallory Sullivan, the Community Development Block Grant Administrator. Um, and I'm here to present to you tonight the CDBG subcommittee's recommendation for program year 47. This year we received 23 applications um, across the five categories of CDBG, which are affordable housing, public mm -hmm. services, economic development, uh, public facilities, and planning and administration. The subcommittee members uh, individually reviewed and scored each of the applications based upon um, an evaluation rubric uh, with seven different criteria. And then the subcommittee met uh, over the course of three meetings to convene and review and to make recommendations. The total uh, requested amount across those 23 applications this year totaled $1,253,216. And the subcommittee's recommendation for program year 47's budget is $1,200,515. Um, I'd like to thank the members um, of the select board who are members of the subcommittee, um, as well as our uh, resident members. Um, and I would like to make a request that the uh, select board moves this to town meeting for endorsement. Thank you. And Thank you for no one bringing up the fact that I confused the CBG committee with the CP CPAC committee. All right, we'll go to the board. Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, while we start, we're gonna take a vote on the CDBG. I, I would like to vote on the various categories, but I wanna point out on the first category, re rehabilitation and housing, I am going to recuse myself and, and I'm gonna request if we can do separate votes for each of the categories, if that's possible. Um, the reason for that is one of the recommended um, entities is Caritas Communities. 
I have done some legal work for them out, outside of Arlington, but uh, for that reason, I, I feel like I need to recuse myself from that vote. All right, and that's no problem. Uh, Mrs. Mahan? Um, I would like to uh, make a two-part motion to move approval on um, all of the CDBG recommended votes with taking the uh, affordable housing capital improvements Caritas uh, communities as one vote and the remaining as a second vote. And uh, before I get a second from that, if I could ask, um, for, first I wanna give a testimonial to Ms. Sullivan, um, how informative, uh, uh, knowledgeable, and really on top of everything that's come out of CDBG. Arlington's lucky to be a CDBG community, um, but under the uh, Federal CARES Act, the Recovery Act, all the different acts that have come out, um, she and you know Jenny Great has certainly been on top of that. Um, it, one of the questions I'd like to ask through you, Mr. Chair, to Mrs. Sullivan is with um, the anticipated approximately 30 plus million of the recovery act that the town of Arlington is um, anticipating receiving, do you see any need for the CDBG subcommittee that there might be another separate uh, sort of CARES Act or something funding that we need to meet in July? Or is the 36 point, approximately 36.7 million something that the CDBG subcommittee does not need to have a role in? Ms. Sullivan? Yes, thank you. We, um, so we are awaiting further guidance um, from HUD and from um, various uh, organizations that provide uh, legislative insight. Um, so I'll start with that, but we would certainly, um, certainly want the subcommittee's input. Um, that's been um, a very important part of this process um, for me personally, but also of course, um, to make sure that the projects that are receiving funding are those um, where there's greatest need based upon uh, the subcommittee's um, understanding as well as based upon our um, public comment process. Okay, so I would uh, renew my motion that it's a two-part motion to vote the first um, affordable housing caritas communication is one motion, the rest is a second, and just ask um, through the town manager um, regarding the Co Recovery Act funds um, if the CDBG subcommittee um, led by Ms. Sullivan um, needs to meet again in whatever month that you all will oversee that. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Sorry, um, I'd like to second that motion uh, and also express appreciation for everything that the CDBG um, committee is doing, especially uh, my colleagues on this committee. I know that it's really hard work um, processing and choosing amongst various grants and uh, and, and also uh, not giving people I mean, all that they ask for when their causes are really uh, great causes. So thank you and I look forward to voting for this. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, I'm happy to support it. Just one clarification. So is this the actual approval of the CDBG and re referral to town meeting, or is this just a referral to town meeting? Attorney Hines? So I'm correct sorry. me if I'm wrong, like, the way I remember it working is we like, so the actual people who can authorize the expenditure of the fund are the select board with a sixth vote from the town manager. And then, but we're the, we're the actual dispersing authorities. We're, we're the ones who actually appropriate the money. And, uh, but then we send it to town meeting as a gesture of good faith and education saying, please endorse these priorities that we've already approved. And I can't, and I'm asking for clarification. Are we, are we actually literally doing the vote tonight? In which case you also need the, uh, the town manager uh, to vote in the roll call. Attorney Hyman. So I'm sorry, Adam, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think we're doing both in one okay. vote tonight uh and, that, and my recollection is that's how we've done it in the past that it's it's both a vote approving the budget itself and a forward to town meeting 
Great. So the, the, yeah, and I would just add that that's what I drafted as you know your it's a Warren article hearing, uh, but I appreciate the precision with respect to describing what's 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 happening. But yeah, the town manager would vote on this, but the report to town meeting only has your votes because it's the select board's report, not the manager's. Full support. Thank you. Thank you. And that will turn to the public. If any members of the public would like to speak on this article, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom application. Seeing none, we have a motion to approve that's been seconded. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll be conducting this vote with Mr. Chapdelaine's vote, but just to be clear, it will only be uh, your vote that I report for the purposes of the one article. Attorney Heim, sorry. Just a for clarification. So we're going to vote on. We're going to separate the two votes on this. Got it. Uh, Mr. Corsi. So the first vote it will be just on the allocations for the reha rehabilitation and housing category of the recommendations. Mr. Corsi. Abstain on that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay. And Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy is abstaining. Uh, Mr. Uh, Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. And Mr. Chapdelaine, your vote for the purposes of the actual disbursement. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and then we will take a separate vote on all additional recommendations. Attorney Hein. Thank you for bifurcating the motion, Ms. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd? Yes. And Mr. Chapdelaine. Yes. Thank you. It's a unanimous vote. All right. That closes our warrant article hearings. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. All right, articles for review. So we have final votes and comments on Article 8, Article 9, Article 10, Article 17, Article 18, Article 22, Article 70, and Article 91. I will Mr. Chair, yes. may, may I briefly make a statement? Yep. Thank you so much. Um, uh, members of the board, uh, this is why we do draft final votes and comments. Uh, member of the board contacted me earlier to uh, correct the final vote, vote and comment with respect to the adult, uh, the young adult and youth advisory board. I made that change. I hope that the, the second iteration of it was uh, transmitted to you, but the short version of it is the uh, one of the two DEI uh, uh, positions was uh, taken out. Um, the second change that was made was uh, to reflect that Mr. Diggins did not vote uh, in the positive or did not vote for no action on Article 22, which was the one about email addresses. And I uh, added a line about noting the uh, some board members expressed interest in exploring the issue further, including whether or not alias addresses would be technically feasible. And then finally, um, the town clerk your very first one, um, I, I had uh, sort of mushed together uh, a couple of things that had been talked about, uh, but it's a very simple uh, fix. The date, the controlling date, instead of being January 31st, should be January 1st. So I've made uh, that, that administrative correction to the final votes and comments in front of you. Thank you. And so I'll read these down. We are voting on the final votes and comments as described by Attorney Heim. Any comments or revisions to Article 8? Article 9? Article 10? Article 17? Article 18? Article 22? Article 70? Article 91. Seeing none, I will take a motion from Mr. Higgins. I motion to approve. Mrs. Mahan? Second. Additional comments, Mr. Dunn? 
No comment, thank you. Yeah, Mr. DeCourcy? No comments. All right, and Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to approve that has been seconded. Thank you to all the board members for your thoughtful feedback on all these, I appreciate it. Um, Mrs. Mohan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right. So, of course, on this received, we have traffic concerns regarding the road utility and repair work to new food link building in 108 Summer Street by Eugene Downing, 5 Montrose Avenue. Fort Street parking meter enforcement, Guy Morello via the request to answer set center. Mr. Corsi? I move receipt. I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd ask Mr. Chapdelaine if I don't think any referrals are required in these, but I, I want to check to see if he, he thinks we should be doing that. Otherwise, I'll just move receipt. I, I mean, I, I suppose uh, as a formality, referring them to my office for response might be appropriate. Sure. Okay. I'll amend my motion to that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Second. No comment. All right. Mr. Diggins, any additional comments? No comment. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? No, no comments. Thank you. All right. And so, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to refer. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Mr. Diggins. Sorry about that. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. You had a misspoke. And we have an item for discussion, future select board meetings. We want to make sure that this isn't Mr. Dunbar's meeting. So let's see where we are. Um, so I just going to open up to Attorney Heim to tell us where we are on Warren articles, um, what's left to be heard. And then we as a board can talk about options if we need to add additional things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've got about eight articles left. A few of them are on the um, easier side in the sense that things like revolving funds um, don't typically have a lot of discussion, but there are a few big ticket ones, including the real estate transfer fee, um, an article about uh, rock excavation, um, an article about uh, pest management at sites that sort of builds off the good neighbor agreement, and I believe an article about um, restricting uh, affordable, restricting the affordable housing appropriations to uh, folks earning a certain amount of money. So they're, 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 they're not super brief. And there are some of them that would be hard for me to draft up a preemptive comment. In other words, as the board may recall, there are some years where I'm able to basically draft a, a memo, but then contained in that memo is the sort of, you know, comment that you might provide or draft vote that you might provide. Um, I can't do that for a couple of these. So the question is whether the board um, wants to schedule uh, another meeting. Um, I will note that to my recollection, it's pretty normal for there to be a vote on the draft select board report after the election of new members uh, following the town election. So basically we have one more round of Warren articles that need to be uh, addressed by the select board. Uh, and the question is whether or not we can do that at your next regularly scheduled meeting or not. All right, we do have one meeting in the interim. So I'll turn to the board for any discussion, comments as to whether or not you think we can cover it in the meetings that we have on the books already, or if anything in the interim is necessary. Mr. Diggins. Well, um, we, I guess if we start at our usual time, I mean, and we want to get through them all, and we should be prepared, I mean, to do a late night. The alternative is to start a little earlier, I mean, um, and just do a longer meeting. Hopefully, it won't be as late a night. I mean, I think it'd be good if we could get through um, them all in uh, on the fifth or whenever, I mean, and then have our um, approval, a short approval meeting, I mean, uh, on that Wednesday or Thursday, the seventh or the eighth, I mean, um, but I think we're going to need uh, two meetings. It's just a matter of whether we need 
three. So let's try to have just two. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I agree we're going to need two. And, and just the question is whether we do something before the fifth. I mean, I, I could, if the seventh works for people, I could see holding that open. If we get the work done on the fifth, great. But I, I'd be uncomfortable just having one meeting um, just because something could come up on the fifth. Yep. Mrs. Mahan? Sounds good to me. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, is it, I guess my, I, my thought would be do one a week from today and the fifth, if, if we want to, rather than a Wednesday, but, um, I can make things work. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if the board is inclined, I would prefer to do the fifth and then assuming that if we have to meet on Wednesday, it would be a pretty short meeting. Um, I think that that would work out better for me, but I can make whatever the board wants to do work. The chairman? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I thought it, there may have been a conflict for at least one member on the 29th, and then that that, that, that that was one of the reasons why we didn't select that date. Yeah, yeah could we, if, if it's possible, could we put the, I was the one with the conflict, but I don't have that anymore. We can, mm. maybe could put the 29th back on. Mm. If that's okay with my colleagues. Yep. I mean, if that works for everyone else, that works for me. Mr. Dunn? It works for me. I, and I certainly wouldn't have suggested if I knew there was a conflict. So I'm glad that uh, my ignorance worked in my favor. All right. Yeah, that was the reason I wasn't suggesting it was because I, I was aware of that conflict. So yeah, the 29th, yes. I mean, then the 5th, and then if we need the 7th, I mean, hopefully we won't need the 7th. Okay. So cool. All right, so we'll plan on the 29th and the 5th for the next two meetings to wrap up our warrant article period. A quick question. Yes. You know, for you, those of you who have been around, is this the longest streak of Monday meetings that the select board has had? Because <laughs> we were like on a roll. <laughs> if you ask my wife, then the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> it's almost like we're the finance committee, except we're not meeting Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> Actually, back in the 90s, right before I ran for the board, they were meeting every Monday night for like three, four months in a row. All right. That's a whole nother story. But, nice. um, you know, I, I, I thank you. I, I apologize to my colleagues. I originally said no because my husband will be traveling, but I'm, a, I'm able to make that work because I think he might be home that 29th. So I'm all set with that. And if we have, have to add another meeting, that's not great, but that's okay too. All right, so I don't think we need to vote on this. So we'll plan on meeting next Monday and the following Monday to wrap up our warrant article. And that takes us to new business. Attorney Hyam. Um, the only new business that I want to note is that we continue to work diligently um, with our legislative delegation um, on the special uh, legislation. Uh, we've got most of it ironed out and those uh, things should be submitted from the Fall special town meeting. Thank you. Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two brief pieces of new business. One, uh, the weather's getting nicer. So we are once again working on getting outdoor dining going with the restaurants. Planning and community development are working with the Chamber of Commerce and restaurants to uh, get them up and running. And we should have an announcement or announcements to report soon on when, uh, when we'll st start to see those tables outside again. So uh, ho hopefully the weather holds and people can start getting out of patronizing Arlington restaurants. Uh, and then second, I wanted to mention um, the town uh, applied or sort of participated uh, with a group of eight other communities, the Cambridge Health Alliance and Tufts University to become a regional vaccination site. Uh, as I think the board knows, we did our, what would have been our last first dose clinic last week. We'll now roll out the remainder of the second dose clinics as a, an applicant or as part of this uh, regional collaborative, we found out last week that that collaboration was approved by the state. So it's been approved as a collaborative, but not approved for vaccine yet. Um, but we're hearing that vaccine doses are on the rise coming into the state. So we hope very soon we'll be part of this regional collaborative that will have doses and Arlington residents will be able to access vaccinations at a site 
at Tufts University, so much closer than Fenway Park, the Natick Mall, or Gillette Stadium. So more to come on that, but I think it is positive news, and uh, I hope it exemplifies our sort of tireless effort to try to get uh, Arlington residents uh, vaccinated as easily as possible. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corsi? Uh, no new business. You, Mr. Dunn? Uh, yeah, one short one. I really loved the mess, the email that we got from uh, Susan Elmore, uh, a resident of Norcross Street and the town manager. Uh, she was looking for guidance about plogging, which is when you pick up litter while you're jogging and then throw it away. And the town manager clarified that it is indeed appropriate and to throw it away in park receptacles. And I wanted to thank Ms. Elmore for helping keep Arlington clean. Mr. Higgins? I can't follow that. I have no new business. <laughs> uh -huh. um, just uh, two, possibly three things. Spoke about the CDPG funding and the Recovery Act. Um, I also know that um, myself and Mr. DeCourcy is uh, chair of long range planning and Charlie Foskett and the town manager um, have had conversation amongst others regarding the Recovery Act monies and issuing a statement about um, a sort of estimate of what those monies are and what they can be applied to. Um, and I know there's been some postings by our colleagues on the school committee regarding those money monies. Um, I know there's an upcoming meeting on the 31st with the Finance Committee, as well as I think April 12th with the Long Range Planning Committee that Mr. DeCourcy chairs, and we'll be discussing that. Um, but there, it, it, it's kind of confusing to some in terms of the town of Arlington received 30 something million in Recovery Act um, reimbursements for one year, and the schools are going to receive monies from three different, their separate recovery act, their DESE and their um, infrastructure funding. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that on the radar that we need to, you know, kind of keep that in mind. And then the other thing is something that I had been working on and Mr. Kiro um, sort of took the reins and I've taken it back. And what I'd like to do is, um, ask the chair if it's appropriate to put on a select board meeting between a very brief agenda item between now and the 10th, or we can do it after the 10th. But um, I attended a Zoom meeting uh, regarding civil discourse um, with the MMA, Massachusetts Municipal Association, which a lot of the stuff I already kind of knew, but there were a couple suggestions that really made sense to me. And one of them was, um, some cities and towns when um, women or men take out papers for a city council or select board, um, they get the uh, code of conduct or select person um, protocol book that Mr. Grilly um, had worked on and we now have, they get that when they're running, which I think that's a good idea. But I don't think that's something we can do right now because I, I don't want anyone to say myself or the board sending it out saying that um, candidates need to be reminded of that. So what I'd like to do is um, a two pot request. Uh, after the April 10th election, any new member that's been elected gets the code of conduct uh, as it exists with the current select board. And we also have an agenda item that the um, select board discusses, which I thought was a good idea that came out of the MMA civil uh, discourse discussion is that uh, actually two pot recommendation. Anytime t anyone takes out papers for the select board, um, they get the code of conduct or select person protocol book so that they know what it is they're, they're signing up for. And then the other suggestion was, which I'd like to be an agenda item uh, along with that, is that any other town committees, commissions, authorities, et cetera, um, also either have a slim, similar uh, uh, code of conduct and or have a uh, uniform statement at their meetings 
as people participate in person or remotely to say that these committee members are conducting themselves in this way and we also expect that from the public. Um, so along civil the issue of civil discourse, making sure um, everybody's uh, on the same page. So uh, I'll work that with Mr. Hurd as the, the current chairman. If we can get that done before April 10th, that's great. If we can't, I'll work with the next chairman. But um, I just wanted to put it in, in, in you all's bonnet that that's something that I think we need to discuss in terms of, you know, before we can say that anyone who comes before us, you know, this is what we expect of you. If we make a statement and make it uniform across all of our committees and commissions that this is our statement, how we're going to conduct ourselves. And we, we would appreciate the same from you. So thank you. Thank you. And my only piece of new business, I just want to give a heartfelt thank you to Chief Flaherty, Captain Flynn, and Officer Brandon Wentz. Last week was my son's sixth birthday. We had a little outdoor event for some of his friends. I just, he likes to, every day he comes home from school, he puts his blue shirt on that he says this is his chief's outfit. And he says he wants to be the chief and he wants me to ask the town manager to make him chief. And I told him he has to wait till he graduates college, which he now understands. But <laughs> a, week or, a couple of weeks ago, I think uh, my wife had seen something on Facebook that um, Captain Karn was retiring. And he saw that as an opportunity to join the force. So he asked me to reach out to the chief and see if he could be hired as a police officer. So I had reached out to Chief Flaherty to see if she could just send somebody by just to say hello to Dylan during his birthday. And Officer Wentz and Captain Flynn showed up and Captain Flynn read him his oath of office to become an officer, gave him a certificate making him an honorary police officer for the in the APD and it was really an amazing amazing event and uh you know a lot of people there were almost um reduced to tears so, so I just want to thank those three and the APD for you know this is just another example of the community policing model that has been in around in the APD for many years and it was just it was a really great event he has now asked me that now that he's a police officer when does he have to go to the police station I just I tell him that everyone's working from home during COVID so but I do want to thank them for that with that I will take a motion to adjourn uh do we have an executive session Mr. Chair regarding um ITRON yes we do all right, we'll take a motion to adjourn, to move to executive session. Mr. I'd like Chair, to make I? a motion to move to um, executive session and with attorney Hines guidance that when we come out of uh, executive session, let's see says differently, it will be for the purposes to adjourn. adjourn. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mahan. Mm -hmm. And I just add that we're, we're entering executive session for the purposes of discussing uh, uh, litigation with uh, ITRON uh, Incorporated. All right. And, and when we come out of executive session, it's for the purposes to adjourn or to take a vote? Uh, I think what you've made clear is that you, yes, to, to, to adjourn, that you'll adjourn in executive session. Okay, so that, that would be my motion that we enter into executive session. And when we finish, we uh, come out by making a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Hard. All right. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Mr. Dunn? Yes. All right, we have a motion that has been seconded. Attorney Hine? Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. So as we finish by 11 o'clock, yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Okay. So unanimous vote to go into executive session for the purposes of discussing uh, potential litigation with ITRON and that the board shall adjourn from an executive session and not reconvene an open session.